Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special uh, late night edition of the Board of Selectmen meeting here uh, September 5th. Um, we'll open as we usually do with our liaison reports. We'll hear from the town manager after taking public comment. We have a series, uh, we have a proclamation of uh, recovery month uh, with ARCASA. Um, we've got a series of topics, including volunteer subcommittee appointments, the approval of a 186 Summer Street um, preservation restriction, and that will be joined in that meeting with the Historic District Commission and the Historic Commission both. Uh, we'll, we'll continue our discussions of last week from the Board of Health. We'll bring up a discussion from, I think, um, six years ago, 2011, on the subject of train, um, the depot parking, and the compo shared sticker pricing. And then we'll review demand fees, um, history and, and propose if, what if anything we do about them. We have one set of minutes to approve and uh, that will be it for the evening. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll, I only have one thing to report. I did want to make a note that um, former Reddingite Brendan Hildreth, uh, grandson of uh, our own Bill Brown, was recently um, appointed to the North Carolina Council on Development Disabilities by Governor Roy Cooper. And uh, that, that's a council that works throughout the state to assure that people with disabilities of all sort and their families have uh, access to community service, services, indiv indiv individualized support, and other forms of assistance. So that's a, that's a group of 40 persons of which 60% uh, are those afflicted with um, intellectual or other developmental disabilities. So um, Redding's uh, youth go far and wide, and this is a great contribution. I know his parents, I, we obviously know and love uh, Bill, but this is a great young man who didn't choose this path, but has made the best of it, and uh, he's made the paper, so. My daughter tells me he's more diplomatic than I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to imagine. No, yeah. shock there, Bill. <laughs> so I, I have a copy, I'll pass it around for others, but um, with that, I'll turn to my right, Mr. Halsey. Um, I have nothing to report except the wedding. <laughs> I was busy with that. Yeah, all week. Fatigue, so. <laughs> no. um, Dan. Yes, I'm happy to report that a meeting has been set up uh, between myself, the RMLD, two board members, and the CAB to discuss uh, uh, a suitable annual CPI index for increasing the uh, payment in lieu of taxes. That meeting will be held on September 20th at 6.30 p.m. at RMLD headquarters. And I'm assured that uh, that's far enough in advance of some down that will not interfere with the religious obligations that evening. Uh, Bob, I also want to ask about the timing of your review. I, I feel like I've dropped the ball on something here. Uh, am I supposed to be requesting and aggregating? <laughs> All right. I don't know. Between now and I'll, the next meeting. I'll I help however you need you, me to help. <laughs> has that form that you guys were exchanging been finalized? To, yeah, I think I sent you the same one as last year. I'll go yeah, back and right. look at my email. Send me the final form. Send. I'll take okay. care of disseminating through you or otherwise and then okay. aggregating the results. All right, thank you. And uh, if we have time on the 26th, I guess we could do, yep. do that either. Good, thank you. Anything else? That's all. All right, Barry? Uh, nothing to report other than um, uh, Dan and I had a VASC meeting today, which will be part of the agenda later on. Thank you. Andy? Nothing for me. Very good. With that, I will open the floor to public comment. If any, if you choose to speak, please stand, speak your name for the, for the audio, and uh, tell us what's on your mind. Uh, Nancy Dock from Pearl Street. I wanted to address uh, several statements that the Board of Selectmen made last Tuesday, um, August 29th, after the Board of Health left. First was the question that was raised as to why the Board of Health did not contact Town Council for consultation. Well, in the past, when I have asked the Board of Selectmen directly to contact the Town Council for another health-related issue, I was told by the former chair not to. I'm going to share that email. Nancy, would this be better served under the subject no. matter no. devoted to this? No, All right. but thank you. Um, the question, I think, is why did the Board of Selectmen and the Town Manager not con contact Town Council? Because in our July Board of Health meeting, we shared our June 27th uh, letter from Cheryl Sabaro, who's the Director of Policy of, of Law, of Policy and Law, and her email opened with the statement, quote, this is really an issue for Town Council. That letter was read aloud in our July Board of Health meeting. The copy was made available to the Board of Selectmen uh, Liaison through our chair. Um, I will also give Caitlin a copy of that. 
my concern was town council. It was apparent he had never been informed of the public health nurse's um, email until last Tuesday night. Now, the other issue is the board, uh, your chair, made a compelling statement about business protocol, needing good chemistry, behavior for the good of the community. The question is then, why has the Board of Selectmen failed to follow through on the Board of Health's repeated requests to investigate why we have lost three health department employees in six months? This was a request that was made to the former chair, it's been made to the whole board, and it's made to, made, has been made to our liaison. I don't recall I actually, that. I actually find it curious why nobody is interested in why our public health nurse left so abruptly. If you remember last week, Jean specifically said she almost fled town hall. What we're talking about is what we call duty to care. Now, goodness, and when we talk about goodness, I'm gonna remind people, my nursing license, Donna Pierce's nursing license, we have a moral clause as do 3.1 million nurses. That's called the Nurses Act. It means we have to ethically and legally be good. Now, the last question I have, and this is really for the board, I'm gonna give Caitlin all of these for the record. This is the former chair's email. This is Cheryl Savaro's email that was made available to the board. And this is also our reference to Cheryl Savaro's email and the request to have town council be notified that was in our approved meeting minutes, it's on page three. The last question I have is, I am still waiting for an explanation as to why was the police detail sent to the Board of Health's meeting? I didn't send it. I've requested that information from the board. I think it has something to do with that chain of emails that was precipitated by Ms. Pierce from the surrounding communities. I don't there know of an There was a potential of a number of nurses showing up in solidarity. We didn't know what was going to happen. To I an open meeting? Yeah. And What was the threat to public safety? I don't know, but someone said they felt unsafe. It wasn't me. And the police were summoned. Could you be more specific? No. Because I'm on a board. I am a taxpayer. <clears throat> that's on a volunteer board and a police detail was sent to a board meeting and stood behind a volunteer taxpayer. I would like an explanation. It wasn't to intimidate you, Nancy. It was because someone felt unsafe because of events that had transpired, which could have caused the crowd to show up. We didn't know what the motivations of that crowd were. I, okay, that's I what I heard. I see a crowd here. How, how, do you know how many people showed up at that meeting? I believe there Two. were. Nancy, I believe the point is you don't know what you don't know. Right. So please I, answer the question. Why was a police detail? That is that's not what a very. I heard. What was the threat to safety? A lot of nurses? Is that the explanation? A lot of nurses were coming to an open meeting. There was a clear effort on the part, I don't know if I'm stepping over the line here, the part of the former health nurse through some means of, of a mass email chain to announce her sudden departure from Reading. Mm -hmm. And I think foment a lot of anxiety in other communities. But that's not material. The point is that a town not. employee felt unsafe and right. requested it. And that's all that, we need. That's all you need to know. That's all we need to know. And that's not And was there a reason why you didn't inform the board of what the threat was? It's not material. It's not material. I didn't know about it until the police knew Nor did there. I. It occurred after I, um, I became aware of it after it happened. But the point is, it, all it takes is a single individual to say, look, I don't know what's going to happen or I'm feeling uncomfortable. We don't know what's going to happen. No one's got a timepiece to look into the future. And no one in the town thought or deemed it necessary to notify the board, it was our meeting, that there was a threat? It's not material. We don't notify folks when we have the police in the back for whatever reason we do. And you're necessary. not notified if there's a threat there's made? There's police at town meeting all the time. There's a guy in I'm the back. I'm asking you. You're not okay. informed when a police officer no. shows up because the, a threat's been made in one of your meetings. Not necessarily. No. We're not. A police officer often is here. Mm -hmm. For reasons not only to the them. Police officers are always welcome in town hall. They're always welcome at town meeting. Any town meeting, as far as that is concerned, I'm sh at I every at every town meeting, 
there is at least one or more. It was highly officers. unusual. It and was. you've been to our meetings. It was highly unusual. Yes. And, you have and, been to our meetings. I have. They are not rather mm -hmm. rambunctious. No, but this employee felt that there was an overt threat or the potential of one, and that's all we need. That's the sad comment here, is that there was an apparent threat that caused a single employee to say, I don't feel safe. Would you mind if we have one of the police stand by just in the event that a number of people were to show up or the meeting were to get out of control? To an open Fortunately, meeting. Fortunately, none, none of mm -hmm. that happened. I'm just making sure I have it on the record. An open meeting. There's lots of open meetings where police mm -hmm. yeah. Nancy. This yeah. is simply out of an abundance of caution for the for the welfare of the individual involved. That's all. I find it really actually quite questionable. What, and what is questionable? We we just gave you your answer. Uh, what, what is questionable about that? That anybody would feel that threatened <clears throat> by a couple of nurses who actually, you know what's really interesting? You know, the Pew Research, I don't know how long they've been in business for, 60 years? Every year, you know who's voted the most trustworthy profession? Nurses. I don't think it's a question of and, and the only year we weren't number one was the year after 9-11. The firemen got us down to number two, but that was only for a year. So were you somehow in fear of the police officer that was present at your meeting? I thought it was rather odd that a police officer would stand behind board members. Police officer didn't... It, I think you just want to stay off the camera. Not be the center of attention. I don't think it was any more. That's how that. I read it. Well, as Lucy would say, there's some explaining to do. We just did. Okay. We, we would do the same for any board that felt yeah. that felt the same way. Any board can request the police, not a, even a board right. or an attendee at that meeting can request an officer. Thank you, Nancy. Any other further public comment? Yes, stand up, give us your name, and. Beth Sherland. I wanted to let you know that I'll be resigning from the Board of Health, effective as soon as I'm done speaking, and I want to explain why I'm doing that. Um, I have deep roots in this town. I was born and raised here. I left to get educated and married and have some kids and came back to raise my children here. So when the opportunity came out to be on the Board of Health, I was eager and excited to give back to my community. I thought I might be able to add something. And I had a great year and a half collaborating with my fellow board members and the health division employees. The meetings were great. There was a lot of interesting things going on, and we were really getting some things done. But since January, that changed. As we got close to passing tobacco regulations, there became an adversarial relationship between the board and the board of selectmen and the town management. We were interfered with and thwarted at every turn. The culmination of this was last Tuesday night. It felt like we were on trial for our concerns about the new health agent. It was the most horrible experience I've had at a committee meeting in my career, and I've been on a few committees. It was toxic. It became clear that my time and opinions as a member of the Board of Health were not valued, and frankly, I don't have a lot of free time, so I have to use it judiciously. Last Tuesday, there was concern expressed about the public health of Reading. Since January, as Nancy mentioned, we've lost our health agent, our health inspector of 20 years, and our public health nurse. The latter two left as a consequence of the hiring of Laura Vlasic. Three very qualified people left because they were working in an unsupportive work environment. This is firsthand information. I've spoken to all three of those people that left. This is where time and attention needs to be spent, not putting your volunteers on trial. Volunteers are a great resource for this town, but only if you use them effectively, not as rubber stamps, but as dedicated advisors with unique areas of expertise. These boards were put in place to create a broader range of thoughts. That's what makes a healthy town and a successful government. Thank you for listening, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to have served my town for the past two years. Thank you. Beth, let me say thank you for your service. Thank you, John. Any other comments from the board? Will we take another comment? Any other public comment? Yes. Please stand, announce your name, so the folks at home know who's speaking. Rebecca Zieberman, Pratt Street. I appreciate the fact that you're going to uh, discuss the raising of fees, uh, because I think we need alternatives to an override. Uh, I've suggested many, uh, many times and many ways that we could raise uh, fees easily and painlessly. <coughs> we need to 
stop holding teacher positions hostage and the, and the funds that we do have, we need to spend wisely and demonstrate to our, uh, to the town uh, residents that we are, uh, that we care and uh, spend money appropriately. Uh, people were really, I went to a lot of the listening sessions and I was listening. Uh, my impression is that folks are very supportive of paying for education, but they don't like the idea of an override that where funds cannot be earmarked past year one. And uh, this was going on at the same time that there were plans to build big budget projects, the DPW garage, a multi-million dollar early childhood center. And uh, none of that, uh, none of the budget woes in the education budget came up at the time that these big projects were being put on the table. Uh, so I just want to, uh, want to say lastly that teachers and public safety officers have to be the number one priority. If that means cutting, cutting drama, cutting athletics, whatever it takes, but teacher positions can't be on the table. Otherwise, we're going to have a, a low morale, constant turnover. We're already seeing some of, the, some of the fallout from what happened with the threat to the teacher positions at the middle school level. And uh, my son is currently in a class of 34 kids. I mean, this is not the town that we want to be. So I just want everyone to keep that in mind. And um, I'll just remind you, I've spoken in public meetings before that uh, when our town manager asked what things could we cut, well, uh, let's, let's end free leaf pickup. We can pay for that. Let's raise the cost of a dump sticker. Why should there be free parking at Reading Memorial High School when the bus costs so much? We could maybe earmark the funds for a late bus and ease the burden on families where the cost is 450 per child with no family cap. I know I've paid for two kids for several years, uh, and, and it's like subsidi subsidizing families who have cars. I have lots of other suggestions I could make for fees, and uh, I, as some people have said, well, it won't plug the entire budget hole. Okay, but maybe we could go for a smaller override. And as also the town manager said in a meeting last year, and he was absolutely right, we have to show that we've turned over every rock, but the teachers need to be on a pedestal away from that rock. They can't be worried every year Otherwise, uh, we had several teachers quit the day before school started. Uh, this is just unfair to our children, and we can't do this. Thank you so much. Thomas, Barry. Uh, Becky, thanks so much. It's um, you basically, that's our work schedule over the next year. And, and as you know, um, this board is going to, working with the school committee, working with the trustees, are going to be turning over every rock and trying to come up with a budget that works. But as you know, from going to the listening session, um, last year, no amount of fee increases is going to um, plug the budget gap that we have, and we're not going to raise fees just so we so that we just because we can. We have to look at fees in a, in a way that makes sense, and not just say, okay, we can raise it. Let's just raise it. Um, we have to look at the cost of covering that that service, and we, and um, th there may be some people who, who would think, okay, I, I I'm for raising the fee a ton of money at the at the um, you know, so I can park at the depot. Those are the folks that might not park at the depot. So we have to look at everybody, um, everybody's needs, everybody's wants um, before we move forward. The other thing too that's really important, um, and this board of selectmen is not going to be able to change state law, which basically is that when you do an operational override, the money is only earmarked for year one. We can say as much as what we like, and, and I think that this board has done it and the school committee has done it as well, to say that if we have the funds going forward, this is what we'd like to spend it on, but unless we want to violate state law, we're not going to say that the funds are going to be earmarked. We can only do that for the first year. So I would welcome your participation and to stay engaged and to stay involved, um, but we have a structural deficit that's going to require an override one way or the other. So we're going to look at fees. One of the things we're going to look on is tonight. Uh, we're looking at, at the depot fee. There's others, um, there's others that are, are in play as well, um, but we're not going to solve the problem just by raising fees. There's going to be an override um, put forth one way or the other, whether it passes or not, that's up to the voters. That is the only way to make sure that what you want, which is teachers, is going to happen. That's the only way. Uh, Becky, I'd also second, Barry said, but amplify it a bit. Your comments would be helpful 
not just tonight, but throughout the whole process, and not just to this board, but to the school committee. The school committee, okay. particularly as it comes to um, prioritization. So a lot of times, an individual in the in the room will have a comment, and it'll resonate with others in the room. They won't stand up and say it, but you'll have crystallized the thought in their mind. And, and I think you do that very well. I'd urge you to stay involved as the, the process unwinds here in, in the fall and as we get into the winter. Thank you very much for your comments, Dan. Yeah, just want to make one point of correction, Becky, uh, on the DPW garage. I believe, Bob, that's never really been in the capital plan. Not we, with a number, not we, yet. It's never been in the plan with a number. Uh, there was a conceptual plan done some years ago. I think the people actually raised that as a shibboleth was the anti-override people. They said, oh, look, we have this big project coming up. It was never in the works. It's not now in the works. So that's that's not one of the big ones that's moving right now. But the school right. project was. It was, and it, but it's pretty much been put to bed as not going to happen. Which You're right, though. That, that was real. That got put on the capital plan. Bob? The uh, early child. Yeah. Bob? Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you for your comments. I certainly agree with virtually all of them. I do want to point out one thing, though, that uh, Marianne Downey, Downing wrote a very a very well thought out email to the board um, yeah. and actually resent it. And she, she also shared one of your topics, which was parking at the high school. And just for complete clarity's sake, that's an issue that only the school committee can decide. This board can have an opinion of it, and the school committee doesn't have to care. Um, that is, you know, they are in full, if you will, care, control, and custody of their property. That's interesting because when I brought that up at the school committee meeting, they said that any parking fees from the high school would belong to the town. Is that wrong? Um, well, when they say belong to, um, they may mean collected and put into the general fund to be shared by all. That could be correct. Um, the schools have a lot more what are called, I don't want to bore everyone, Andre's the only one that's going to like this. No, but I just the, want to the schools have a lot of, right yeah, the schools have a lot of revolving funds. So a lot of the money they collect, for instance, athletic fees, they keep all of it. For parking fees, I don't believe they can keep all of it. They would share it with the whole town. So that's, that's what they're coming. But the means. amount is set by them. But they have to decide whether or not there is a parking right. fee, and if so, what are the terms and conditions. And then, you know, if they collect $50,000, at the end of the year, that revenue goes into the general fund. The next year, it's shared through the budget process. So, so you're, you'd want to go back and have that discussion in terms of the fee level. It goes back to the general fund, so both sides are benefit pro rata, right? Yeah, and just to amplify what, what Barry said, uh, you know, he's in, indeed accurate. Year one, the override can be discussed. It, it can be worded in a ballot question, and it must be followed. Year two, you can do anything you want. But um, in point of fact, this community for at least 12 years has followed a fairly rigid yet flexible way to allocate funds. Um, we do as good a job as any community in terms of both sides, if you will. Schools in town have full discussions about what their priorities are. And as a rule of thumb, um, we share them according to a formula. But either side has the ability to just step out and say, this year I have something different. This year I need $100,000 for point X. And quite often, um, there's been agreement on those. For instance, um, that's how we hired a school resource officer in the police department. That's how they hired some um, you know, public health money, I'm sorry, student health uh, services in the high school. So it's a flexible thing, but it's not that all of a sudden in year two, something's going to happen that no one could have predicted. That's not how it works. And it, it hasn't for 12 years at least. And the Finance Committee has a very rigorous process that's followed in that sense. Yes, Mr. Brown. Uh, Bill Brown, uh, Martin Road. Uh, one thing that people must understand, or should understand, fees can only cover the cost of the operation. Yep. You cannot make a profit on fees. And also, a fee, it must be voluntarily, unlike a storm water manager <laughs> fee, which is a tax. Emerson versus City of Boston. Can you repeat that, Bill? I'm sorry. A uh, storm water manager fee is a tax. Yeah. Uh, Emerson versus the City of Boston, 1984, Ma uh, Massachusetts Supreme Court. What he's saying is it's not discretionary, whereas parking is discretionary. You don't have That's to park. Correct. Right. So it can be a fee. So if you, if you collect fees at the high school for parking, you can only minister the cost of what it costs you to have something to look over. And that's all you can do. You can't make a profit. So. Thank you, Bill. Any other comments from the public? Thank you. Bob? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of things. Um, one is to make clear, uh, it's up on our website now, but just to say publicly, the September 20th financial forum has been canceled. 
Again, that was the September 20th financial form is canceled. Uh, it will be replaced, if you will, by a September 27th FinCom meeting. Uh, there was many reasons for it, one including a conflict with religious holidays. Um, but one of the main concerns was the agenda uh, for the financial forum was really a FinCom agenda. The issues, uh, all but one issue, were not, not for all elected boards to sit through. It's really a financial uh, situation. There will be uh, very much uh, an October 11th financial forum at the library. That has always been sort of the big one where we really discuss budgets for the next year. And hopefully the town accountant has some clarity on uh, how free cash closed out. So again, no meeting on the September 20th. Uh, there will be a FinCom only meeting on September 27th. There will be a financial forum on October 11th. And just to be clear, because the selectmen's calendar keeps changing with travel, uh, the next scheduled selectmen's meeting after tonight is September 26th. Right. So tonight replaces the meeting that would have next originally week. planned for next week on the 12th. And the FinCom meeting of the week of the 25th, that's just FinCom. It's not FinCom board of selectmen. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay. And I'll send you all agendas. Anyone's obviously welcome to come. If there's a quorum, we can post you. It's, okay. it's not a problem. Um, the only other thing I had, I wanted to update you from, uh, from Victor, from our uh, senior tax relief program. Uh, they have received 194 applications. And so, so 50 more since we last met. Yeah, and so far they have issued about 10 denials. Um, the Board of Assessors still needs a little bit more information for some of the folks. That's why I say about 10 denials. Um, of the approved applications, there's a total circuit breaker amount of 182,000 and change. So if, for instance, the board set a factor of one, it'd be a $180,000 shift. Two is your maximum, half is your minimum. So you're looking at a 90,000 to a $360,000 shift. And that's a topic that, again, um, the chair and the vice chair have listed as goals to have that discussion right. uh, you know, with the assessors and with myself, and, and we'll be happy to do that. Um, but it was a very successful program. We didn't know, again, we, we discussed numbers of five and 600 last year. We really didn't know because there's no data that you could prove. Um, I am fairly certain that of the 194, we missed someone. And they're gonna be talking to one of their neighbors over the next several months and say, oh, what is that? <laughs> and the other part is, um, although they didn't run into people, we, we suspect that those, that there are people who did not file the state circuit breaker because other communities have run into this issue. Um, you know, it wasn't worth it when it was just a small income tax return. When you possibly double up that and have three times the impact because of property taxes, maybe it's worth it. So that says next year you could get another uptake. So right. I, I would actually expect an uptick next year. Any new program normally has, a, you know, you, you can't communicate with everyone, it's impossible. So I think there would be an uptick. Well, the good news is this is not a bad year one start. No, it's, a, good, it's a really of, good one. If you make any kind of estimate in terms of what next year could be, we'll be almost spot on. Victor had, yep. uh, I thought he had a number like between three and 600, he thought it was a potential yes. pool. That's correct. So this is not far off if you're 200. running forward. No, yeah. not, no, it isn't. Yeah. And obviously, you know, these, if you will, the neediest 200 seniors, it's gonna make a big difference to many of them. Why we're doing it? Yeah, Bob. Was there any way to know um, of the people that were declined? Um, if any of them were declined because their property is in a trust? I have heard that anecdotally, but I don't know. I can't give you any facts. But um, uh, when Victor last wrote you a report, I think it was one or two meetings right. ago, he did cite that as a reason. But that was the reason for folks not. I think he talked talk to folks before they applied to try to detect right. that. Yeah, so that's true. They may not have been rejected. They just, he knew they that's wouldn't right. qualify. That's a good point. And, and, and just one last thing. Um, do we know, so the 193 folks that came by, do we know sort of what was the um, single most um, important factor in getting them to know about it? Was it the Chronicle? Was it the Senior Center? Don't know. Was it the website? We, we don't know. Don't know. Okay. I'm not sure if they asked, honestly. Um, he, he did, a, I think, two, maybe three, I'm not sure, meetings down at the Senior Center that were very well received. Good. Good. And I know we got a lot of references from that, if you will. Good. But we certainly got a couple emails, too, so. Yeah. That's all, right. all I have. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, with that, we have a proclamation for uh, Recovery Month. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll read the short version first and then the longer, uh, if you'd like. I move that the Board of Selectmen declare September 2017 as National Recovery Month. 
Second. That first thing. Read it. Yes. Oh, I read it now. <laughs> Proclamation, National Recovery Month. Whereas behavioral health is an essential part of health and one's overall wellness, and whereas the Board of Selectmen determined that substance use disorders were profoundly impacting the town and our residents such that they helped establish the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse in 2006 to improve community collaboration and reduce substance misuse, and whereas prevention of mental and substance abuse disorders works, treatment is effective, and people recover in our area and around the nation, and whereas preventing and overcoming mental and substance use disorders is essential to achieving healthy lifestyles, both physically and emotionally, and whereas we must encourage relatives and friends of people with mental and or substance use disorders to implement preventive measures, recognize the signs of a problem, and guide those in need to appropriate treatment and recovery support services, and whereas to help more people achieve and sustain long-term recovery, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, and the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse invite all residents of Reading, Massachusetts to participate in our local celebration of National Recovery Month. And now we, therefore we, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading, Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2017 as National Recovery Month in the Town of Reading and call upon the people of Reading to observe this month with appropriate programs, activities, and ceremonies to support this year's Recovery Month theme, join the voices for recovery, strengthen families and communities. Thank you, Dan. Um, do we have a motion to accept? Yeah, we did. Okay. Um, Erica, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the proclamation. Thanks to Caitlin and to the town manager for helping to get us on your agenda. Um, we're so appreciative to be able to have this as a recognition of National Recovery Month. We're one of um, hundreds of communities across the United States that are celebrating Recovery Month. We have a calendar of events that our president, Pat Shannon, is going to be sharing with all of you and with the audience. Just to give you a sense of what we have coming, we will be at the Fall Street Fair this weekend. Uh, so we invite all the residents to stop by and see what resources we have. Um, we will be hosting um, a special event um, at the Rotary for their luncheon this month. We are hosting a substance abuse in the workplace event with the Reading, North Reading Chamber of Commerce at Fusion Restaurant. We also are gonna be working with all of our churches. Um, we have First Congregational Church as well as the Church of the Good Shepherd in Old South that are working on blanket making through Project Linus. Um, that is a group that is making blankets um, in particular to go to little ones who may have witnessed an overdose. Um, one of the things that the blankets can provide is a small dose of comfort in a really um, scary time for them. So we are very appreciative to our local churches. All of our churches also are working on preventing stigma and they have some signage posted this month and they'll also be doing prayers throughout the month. If anyone has lost a loved one to substance abuse, we encourage you to find comfort at your local church. We also are hosting, um, for the first year in Reading, our regional candlelight vigil and our recovery celebration over at the high school. Um, with our regional partners, that includes Medford, Malden, Melrose, Wakefield, Winchester, Stoneham, and Reading. Uh, we are part of a group called the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition, and we annually host an event that celebrates and also remembers those that we've lost. And this year, the event will be held in Reading. So we invite folks to come down. It's a short ceremony. We'll celebrate those in recovery, and we'll also have a short candlelight vigil, a short walk to remember those that we lost with a luminaria walk. Um, and then to culminate our month, we have our 11th annual ARCASA meeting. We have two great speakers planned, Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan, who's been on the forefront of opioid prevention. We've been working in partnership with her task force for the last three years. And we also are really pleased to have Dr. Ruth Pote coming. She's a family medicine and addiction medicine specialist. She's been speaking all over the country and is considered to be one of the most well-respected speakers. So we encourage everyone to come out to whatever event they can come to. If you can't get to an event, we encourage you to go to our website. You can reach us through the town or the school website. We um, encourage folks to look at the resources we have. Recovery is always possible and recovery works. So we just want to say thank you to the board and also want to say thank you to our board chair, Pat Shannon, also to our, um, our secretary, Sherry Vandenacker, who's here tonight, and Joanne Senders, our media liaison. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for the work you do. Thank you. Is it, would it be okay? Oh, sorry. Oh, very. Is it okay? Uh, so I, I know as um, um, the hospital trust fund recently um, helped with um, sort of plug some funding gap 
for a program that you were implementing, yeah. as I understand it was sort of kind of a clearinghouse for folks to be able to actually find the recovery resources that they need. The problem being people's, people have so many different types of insurance, so they might get a name or to call. They don't take that insurance. They have to wind up calling eight, nine, ten times. Um, do you have any sense of how that's working? Have we had any success stories with that? And um, you know, is it something that we should consider funding in the future? We're very excited. Um, we've been um, working with William James College, which is formerly the Mass School of Preventional Psychology. They run a um, interface referral service, which we are now contracted to be able to provide to Reading residents. Basically, it's a matchmaking service like you described. Um, since we launched in uh, late November, 60 families have been matched with services. That's so great. we're really thrilled to see, and we've had all levels of participation from um, preschool families all the way to elders. Um, so we're continually trying to get the word out, but to have 60 families matched in the first nine months is considered really strong in comparison to some of the other communities that have the service. And um, Interface huge. will also be present at our um, um, our 11th annual ARCASA meeting at the end of the That's month. Um, it, there's information on our website. It's free for residents. They can use it as many times as they would like. Doesn't matter what the issue is. It can be any mental health concern, any substance abuse concern. They basically do the legwork to match you with three quality um, licensed Because that was the hardest thing, is that people maybe want to get into recovery, mm -hmm. but they just can't find the right place because yes. there's nobody there kind of assisting yeah. units. What form does that match up take? Is it a um, it's done over the phone, so there's an intake over the phone. Um, they share what, what they're looking for, maybe I some see. of the barriers, um, and then the licensed clinician who answers the call then says, okay, give me a couple of days, I'm gonna do research. We have a database of credential providers and they will match who has open appointments, who takes their insurance, and who would be the best fit for the what they're looking for. So it could be as specific as um, my husband is in recovery, as a family we wanna talk through some of this. We're also going through um, some issues with caring for an elder parent and my seven-year-old has anxiety. So you could have all of those things in one family situation and so they'd be looking for who's the child care provider in that for maybe a child psychiatrist and then who might be helping the family. And they've been successful in doing everything from outpatient therapy to home care wraparound services for, for Reading residents. Mm -hmm. So we've had folks who've said, I've tried a lot of different things, but this worked for me. Um, so we're really thrilled to hear, especially for folks that have trouble finding a provider that works for them. Um, it's been really successful in that regard. And they also follow up to see how it worked out. As so they track them. As you tabulate your your metrics, when, when Arcasa comes back and talks about the year and wrap up, this might be one an interesting one to yes. add. Yes, mm -hmm. we'd love to share more about the specifics of who used the service, what they used it for, yeah. and all of that kind of stuff. Um, in particular, I know our, our school psychologists have been very happy to have it because it's very simple for families to use instead of saying, here's a list, yeah. I'm, I think this person's good, I'm not sure if they're good. They're saying, here, you're going to talk to a licensed clinician, someone who can work through what you might need. Because sometimes people don't know what they need. They only know that they're in crisis or they might need support. But they don't know specifically what they might be looking for. And that's a clinician who's really trained to help draw that out. Yeah. So that's we'd love to come back for a wrap-up. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Yeah. Um, if I could just have a moment. Sure. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, please great. do. So um, um, I wanted to mention one exciting event that we have coming in October, we hope. <laughs> um, there's an event um, that is called Jams for Jake that was put together by some of our local um, young people who graduated in 2009. Jams for Jake. Um, unfortunately, we lost a young person um, in June uh, who was a great friend of the coalition. Um, his family um, was very supportive when the coalition was founded. Um, unfortunately, um, the, Jake lost his battle with substance use in June and his friends have put together a really fabulous um, music festival that they hope to have in Reading. The permits are kind of working their way through the process. They came and presented to the ARCASA Board of Directors last week, and Bob was able to hear what they had to say. They're very motivated. They've raised $2,000 so far for their event. They've got their logistics in place. They've got a lot of key, key people. One of the amazing things is that the bands will be playing some of Jake's original music and also um, we'll be having information with local resources as well as um, we'll be having guests from Right Turn, which is a creative recovery place in Watertown, in particular reaches out to musicians who are looking to get into recovery. So although it's been a very difficult time for his friends as they're grieving his loss, they've chosen to 
put some of that into action and we're hoping um, that the board will hear more about that in one of your future meetings and we'll be working with with Bob um, through the design review team because there's a lot of different moving parts to the event it will be an outdoor music festival what that will happen in Reading what time are we looking at uh, it'll be late October okay yeah Very so good. thank we're you excited for bringing that to us and uh, my daughter Margaret who's 23 was one year younger than Jake she know, knew of him especially for music and I asked, "Do you know about this event?" She says, "Oh yeah, it's all over Facebook." Mm -hmm. So, a warning to better have it. A warning, <laughs> a warning to all the grown-ups in the room: kids do everything much better than we do. Yeah, right. Fantastic. I think it'll be a blowout. I, I think the attendance will be huge, which is why I offered our services to really have a full design review process, much like we do for the right. Wall Street Fair. What's the target venue? Would it be the target Arts venue? Center? Is uh, Simon's Field, okay. um, oh, and um, we've spoken with the. Um, the arena about using the rare lot for parking. We have to let um, Reading uh, Hockey know that there might be an event that day and also talk with St. Athanasius. But in terms of the event, it wouldn't be on the baseball area, it would be on the backfield. Um, and they have um, plans to, to rent all the necessary um, services that we need, a stage and porta potties and everything that you can imagine. And they have uh, 11 bands already in motion practicing. Um, and there's 11 young people who are on the planning committee um, who graduated in 2009, and they've been working really hard behind the scenes. So. That might be a good one to also get RCTV to help yeah. we, were, we were hoping to do that, yes. We'd love to be able to feature that. Yeah, for sure. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you very much. Any other comments from the board? Oh, you guys are doing great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we need to take our vote. <laughs> all, those, all those in favor of the uh, proclamation? 5-0. Can we present it to you, Erica? Yes, that would be great. great. Thank you. Do you mind if I invite my board member? Not at all. Come on up. Come on up. Okay. Yeah, that's probably a better time. Because the summer I have will be. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for all your support. work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. Join, good work. Hi, Joanne. Thank you. Over here. I am a board member. I sure am. Thank you. Thank you. Would you okay to take a picture with me? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We're going to figure out how to do that. All right. So we should probably come around. Yeah. Come around on either loop. Charles. 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 Thank you so much. They funded Social Security while we were away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. This generation obsoletes the format. <laughs> exactly. Can we take a quick break? I'm just going to restart my computer. Uh, okay. Why don't we take a uh, three minute? Five minutes. Take me five minutes. Perfect. Pack my bag. Why don't we take a five minute recess? Thank you, everybody. Our next topic for discussion is the approval of a 186 Summer, Summer Avenue Historic District Preservation. Oh, sorry. My bad. Thank you. Our next uh, discussion is um, volunteer appointment, uh, subcommittee appointments. The VASC met today at 6.30. We did. And, uh, well, we interviewed uh, candidates for uh, Climate Advisory Committee, one candidate for one position, so that one's easy. Celeste Cracky, uh, very qualified and interesting, uh, to, uh, more of a, an IT information, uh, social media person who's very interested in the environment. So it's a nice compliment to the folks on the committee, I think. Uh, we had two uh, incumbents re-up for the Board of Cemetery Trustees, Janet Baronian and Olive Hecht, and Newcomer, but not really newcomer, Virginia Blodgett uh, was recommended uh, for the open seat. Uh, 
Uh, Council on Aging was a last minute change. Uh, Sally Hoyt had submitted a letter that Caitlin showed us <coughs> asking that, uh, effectively resigning as a full member, but asking that okay. we appoint her as an associate. And we didn't make that recommendation. I will make that motion. Uh, Board of Health, we had two candidates, Kevin Sexton, uh, former selectman, and Heidi Pfeiffer, who's a 32-plus uh, year uh, experienced nurse, uh, lived in Reading for many years. She's a little bit new to town politics, but she has a deep interest in the work that the board is doing. Um, in light of the recent uh, resignation of Ms. Sherland, which Laura just told me is official as of now, we are able to fill both those seats this evening. Okay. We have two candidates that are very good. You felt uh, yep. Heidi was qualified? Yep. We didn't very vote able. on her, but... Yep. Very able. Very okay. good. So... Do you have a motion? I do. Uh, Move that the Board of Selectmen accept the recommendations of the Volunteer Appointment Subcommittee as follows. I'll do them all in one motion. Board of Cemetery Trustees, Janet Baronian, term ending 6-30-20. Olive Hecht, term ending 6-30-20. Virginia Blodgett, term ending 6-30-18. Board of Health, Heidi Pfeiffer, term ending 6-30-18. Kevin Sexton, term ending 6-30-20. These are full memberships. And Climate Advisory Committee, Celeste Cracky, six, term ending 6 20 And the new one is Council on A Aging Associate Member Sally Hoyt for a term ending 6 19 Do I have a second? Yes. Can I second if I'm on the committee? Absolutely. Second. Absolutely. Okay, we have a second. Motion made. Any further discussion? I, I just have a question um, about to Kevin. Your, what are your um, public health What's your public health background? I don't have a public health background. Any other questions? I don't think that's a requirement, Andy, given that you didn't have one. Um, well, I had a, a You're environmental engineer. physiology, toxicology, yeah. mental health risk assessment. So, right. um, yeah, it was, do you have related uh, human health experience? Only from being on the board. I, w I would uh, like to see a someone with some sort of human health uh, background uh, be appointed to the Board of Health. Someone who can understand basic toxicology, basic uh, <coughs> food safety, things like that, um, and the science behind it. Because it, it does come into play at times on the board. You need to understand this. Could I ask a question for Chair? Hang on, Dave. You do have two. You do have um, one candidate and the existing right. chair right. with potentially that skill set. Right. But ideally, the, the entire board should understand these the underlying scientific issues behind the, the various health regulations in the state. Okay. Yeah. Could I, John, could I ask you a question? Uh, I don't, you weren't there for the interview process. Uh, what's your degree of comfort with proceeding? I mean, you're, you're the chair. You do have requisite experience in these areas. Is this an area where mentorship can catch people up on things they need to know, or what would you say? Uh, a lot of it just might be even procedural, uh, so, but uh, I do believe that we could probably catch, we could catch them up on that. I, I do understand the Andy's yeah. view of having a background someone from uh, qualifying, uh, I, I don't think so. Okay. There are no formal qualifications in the role anyway, as described. I understand that. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion on the, on the proposed motion? All those in favor of the motion as made by Mr. Hensminger, raise your hand. All those opposed? 4-1. Motion passed. Thank you to the volunteers. I think we feel a deep debt of gratitude to the folks that take time out away from their families, times away from their jobs, times away from their vacation to work on some of the town's problems. Um, it's, uh, um, it doesn't 
pay very well, but the benefits are great. You get a nice warm feeling out of, out of doing the work. So again, thank you for your volunteers. Okay, and with that, we will move on to the discussion of the uh, 186 Summer Avenue Historic District Preservation Restriction. Um, Bob? Um, yeah, there's uh, two boards here. I don't know if they're called into session. Um, was, uh, do you know if the meetings for us were posted? Yes. And uh, I guess I'd be happy to call the uh, historical commission. Now, our chair is still away in uh, mm -hmm. in uh, New Hampshire, and if I can, uh, at least for free, since it is a formal meeting, I think we're absent the member. And I know Virginia is here. I would like to appoint Virginia as a regular member in the absence of uh, one of our members. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I thought also would like to appoint uh, John Williams. I thought it would be most helpful for the selectmen and myself and those who are a little less familiar with the issue for Ray to give a little bit of a background. I know some of you have gone to these meetings, I have not, some of you have not. So Ray, you could just give us an outline of the okay. scorecard here. I, I won't go all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, but um, as um, both commissions and the board is aware, are aware, the um, uh, the Historic District Commission did issue a certificate for um, for this project some time ago, and one of the connect, one of the conditions of that certificate was that a historic preservation restriction. restriction be placed on the building. Now, a historic preservation restriction uh, can exist in perpetuity, um, uh, but it has to be approved by the Mass Historical Commission. So, uh, unfortunately, we we've been uh, it's been like herding cats. So we started with the um, the Mass Historical Commission model his historic preservation uh, restriction, and um, um, through the, um, uh, the the past quite a few months, um, the uh, Historical Commission and the Historic District Commission crafted something based on on that model, uh, but uh, included a few uh, things that we that were deemed to be um, uh, more suitable for this particular circumstance. And in particular, uh, a, a, a uh, historic preservation restriction is typically uh, in, made enforceable by the Historic Commission, but in this case, since it was attached to a certificate in the Historic District Commission, we wanted to be, make sure that the Historic District Commission would be able to um, uh, enforce it as well. So uh, uh, we came up with a, a version that was acceptable to us. It was ex accepted by Criterion. Um, it was then sent off to the Mass Historical Commission. Um, and they were not happy. Uh, so um, the, um, uh, in particular, and I never really was able to get to the bottom of this, they wanted the restriction to be accepted by the Board of Selectmen. Now, by statute, both the Historical Commission and the Historic District Commission have the authority to accept um, historic preservation restrictions, and you do not. <laughs> so if, if, if they actually wanted to insist on that restriction, it would require that this go to town meeting, and town meeting could grant you the authorization to acquire real an interest in real estate, like, you know, you do what? Um, from time to time otherwise. So um, we said, well, that's nutty. And, uh, <laughs> the, the, um, and, and um, we, um, so we gave them some pushback. I mean, you know, you have two choices in that situation. You just cave and do everything they want or give them some pushback. So we, in fact, did give them some pushback. And um, the, uh, um, uh, the result was they, um, they offered as a compromise that um, they would they would accept the restriction as long as it was approved by the board of selectmen. Um, so, um, is that what you just said? No, we said accepted. So one is one is you own it. Oh, okay. Yeah. One is you are proving that they own it. 
which, okay. which may be technical. It is all technical stuff, but nevertheless, they have the authority to hold it. You don't. And, okay. um, uh, and why Mass Historical doesn't know that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm So do they I'm force other boards of selectmen to do the same thing? Or? Well, I didn't ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Did those boards just cave because they didn't have the time of the energy? Well, I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. I, but, you know, it's, it's a bit nonsensical. So, um, so. Is there any precedent for this right now? Any precedent for, for, for a board of selectmen to do this? To approve it or to accept it? Either. Well, um, I do know of historical um, restrictions that have been accepted by the Board of Selectmen pursuant <coughs> to a town meeting vote. Um, but I just don't, you know, this, uh, this project has just gone around and around and around, and yeah. it, the idea of waiting till November to um, authorize this just um, uh, seemed unpalatable. So, in July, they gave us those comments, and we gave them some pushback on it. Um, and on August 21st, they gave us a second round of comments. Uh, they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll agree to this, uh, uh, this thing as long as the Board of Selectmen uh, 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 approve the restriction. Uh, in the meantime, Mass Historical adopted a new model agreement. Uh, and so they wanted us to reform the original agreement so it matches the new model agreement. No grandfather? Uh, well, you know, it can't be grandfather because we hadn't no, gotten yeah. the other one approved. So, um, uh, so the new one, um, the, the new agreement, um, the um, uh, has a number of provisions involving insurance for the for the building and um, 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 and, and indemnifies the town from damages or injuries related to the existence of the restriction. Um, that's a nice thing, but I I have to say I I'm a little unclear how the town could ever be liable, uh, be liable anyway. But fine. Um, so we made those changes as well. Um, um, Criterion, of course, is very anxious to get this in place so they can get started. Um, they have uh, been very cooperative over the months, um, but the truth is we're not done yet. And the reason we're not done yet is we submitted this version um, to um, Mass Historical, sadly not till last Friday. and. Um, and of course, we haven't. They haven't blessed it. Um, the um, uh, but because of the board schedule and and, and the hope, um, our hope was that um, that we could get every both commissions and the board to take the proper votes, okay. and um, and um, Virginia uh, identified two. Um, uh, one is clearly a typo, and one I think is a typo. Um, uh, in the document, so we'll need to correct those. So I, so the idea here would be um, to vote to accept it as it is, um, but to give me the authority to make minor non-substantive changes, minor or non-substantive changes, um, so we don't have to come back still another time um, and do this again. Um, um, and that way, if if Mass Historical has something that we consider to be minor, we'll just make the change and, and ha have it be executed. Um, but um, you won't have to um, hold another meeting and approve Revisit. it. Revisit it. Okay. Are there so, any comments by either the Historical Commission or the Historic District Commission? Uh, just, uh, uh, I'm Jonathan Barnes, by the way. Um, and, and uh, historical Commission, thank you. Some of us are on both. And I don't know if anybody else has. We obviously we only saw this for the first time today. Okay. Um, so, uh, and it's a very lengthy document to get through, and it was kind of hard. I actually put it side by side with the, with the earlier document. So I guess I would ask if, I, I'm not sure whether you're seeking um, to have either of the commissions, but in our case, the Historical Commission, uh, accept this tonight, or can we vote on this? We have a meeting coming up on September 13th. Um, as I said, I have no idea what the 
feelings are of the other commission members, but um, my sense is seeing a document like this, which we've been over uh, many times and is some 30 odd pages, sure. um, some of us, uh, myself included, would probably have a better comfort level if we had the opportunity to read through it um, a little bit more deliberately. Um, I, I would also ask, Ray, if I can, um, we received uh, a notice that this was on the selectmen's agenda last week for this, and we received uh, a copy last week uh, of what we, I think we all understood was, was the document. In looking at it, it turned out to be very different, very divergent from what we had understood, and very divergent from what we saw today. Um, so just having said that, I would at least, that now we have a, a hard copy. Um, I'm, uh, what we sent, what he's talking about today was the same thing that was sent on Friday. By okay. Yeah. yeah, so I, I'm pretty sure that... <laughs> yeah, we only finished it on Friday. Yeah, yeah that but that is the correct one, and, and last yeah. week's was not. But I guess okay. all I'm saying, I'm just speaking for myself. Okay. Um, I, I, I took a look at what I got this morning electronically mm -hmm. against what I know we had initially voted on and approved in the Joint Commission. I would sort of like a comfort level that what I'm looking at here, if, if your intention is to have us vote on this, um, and if the commissions see fit to do that, um, I would at least want to have a better comfort level that what, since we just got this, uh, I would want to make sure that it is in fact the same thing that we got this morning electronically. Mm -hmm. I'm just speaking for myself. Okay, so um, I don't think that that's a problem. We, um, um, initially told by Chairman's lawyer that Slegman were meeting on the 12th and the 26th, and they said, oh, please, please let it be the 12th because we don't really want to wait till the 26th. Um, and then no sooner was the, was the email sent that then Bob said, oh, by the way, it's not the 12th, it's the 5th. So then we really had to scramble to get it done. Um, but if, you, if you're going to meet on the 13th, I think that's okay. Uh, Can I just ask, I mean, uh, what, what okay. the consensus is of our commission since this is a, a joint meeting? We, we have not had any opportunity to discuss this other than right now. Okay. Does anybody else on the commission, um, on the historical commission, I assume every, you may want to ask the same question of yours. Um, you know. <laughs> yep. okay. So you want to hold off until the 13th? So do both, both commissions have meetings on the 13th? No, I, I know the, the historical commission has a meeting on the 13th. Um, we set up a tentative one. I have to look for the date. I don't know if I have it. Um, September 18th. We won't be back till the 26th, so the 18th kind of works. Done. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything? Well, is there any reason Slackman can't do it tonight? And the yeah, other I, I wouldn't feel comfortable after. doing that. I think that these two boards should act first, and then we can. You say I think that's the right order, Ray. Would you mm -hmm. say? Otherwise, you're approving something that they yeah, haven't done yet, hasn't right. been accepted yeah. or yeah. can't get there. We want them to be comfortable and do all their vetting. Can, can, is, yeah. is there anything that's in the agreement in, in this draft agreement that's different than what was negotiated with Criterion? From what I read, it was just more of um, just more of um, language that just sort of cleans up who was actually responsible. Is, yeah. is there any substantive changes in the agreement with the town and criterion? Well, I, um, the agreement is more specific about activities that are prohibited. There, as I indicated, there, they, um, um, uh, it requires criterion to maintain insurance and to indemnify us. That was not in the original. Um, and that's a good thing for the town. That's a good awesome. thing for the town. That's right. Um, and um, whereas the the previous agreement said it could be amended by mutual agreement, it, it, it now has a whole process to that would need to be followed. From my perspective, uh, Selectman Berman, I, I I agree that first of all there have been numerous iterations of this document. I mean, it was as a result of the initial meeting, the joint meeting with. Uh, the two historical entities that uh, gave rise to the inclusion of the Historical District Commission as, as having authority. We went through several iterations thereafter until we finally reached agreement. This is very, very similar to the last version which we approved, although I would, I would say 
I agree. There are whole provisions in it towards the end um, mm -hmm. that, that we've never seen. I, I didn't have much issue with them, and I doubt that, that others on the commission do either. All I know is I, I, and I would also say some of the attachments were not there. I'm sure they're exactly the same, but perhaps it's, it's the lawyer in me, but I don't, I don't want to sign, nor do I want to uh, bind our successors in perpetuity to a document that, that, that we have not carefully at least read. Um, particularly in light of the fact that we've seen different versions as recently as last week. I, I just want to have a comfort level when I, okay. I presume I speak for others, that this is in fact the same document. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from the board? So it seems the most expeditious path is to defer the approval to acceptance mm -hmm. tonight. Yeah, the approval. Our the approval. 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 Your approval. Our approval. approval. Their acceptance. Yes. You're going to defer your approval to your next meeting, give them a chance to vote right. to accept. I'm struggling over the little alphabet now. <laughs> um, so we'll defer our approval till the 26th, whereupon both boards will have a chance to review and digest. And I presume they'll also have time, if there's any questions, to go through a round of email to clarify those. Oh, boy. Uh, Edward Blodgett, uh, Chair, uh, Greg's Historic District Commission. Um, I'll make that effort to to have a joint meeting with the Historical Commission on the 13th. I that can would schedule be it and see if we get a quorum there. Okay. It's a difficulty. Right. That way that would free it up and we get the interchange back right. and forth. It's the interchange that's the point, understanding how, the, how it's going to work. Uh, my, my major concern is that uh, the criterion be treated fairly in relationship with the rest of the district that when decisions are made, looking at what's been done in the rest of the district, that they be treated the same way right. we want the district to be treated. I think it's okay to see that Eric is um, available to and so it yeah. takes time to look through the document 13. and understand how that's going to work okay. in relationship to the historical commission there also. So two questions. As you sit here tonight, Everett, do you know any reason why that goal isn't achieved? Or no, that's just a, a focus as you go forward? Well, that's the focus as we go forward. I think more. Uh, initially, uh, there was a concern to me because the uh, historical commission had the final say, okay. and you got two different commissions controlling the exterior of the buildings. <laughs> and I'm not sure yeah. exactly how that works. The only concern I would have is that if you meet on the 13th, that it's likely if there's any <coughs> fallout or any questions, you'll have to meet a second time. So that on the 26th, it's all, it is one document, both groups are already signatories or virtual signatories and that the um, <coughs> what approval, we're doing is approving it. Oh the approval is automatic as opposed to tonight where folks haven't even read it. So. I guess the other that. question I would ask is can we at that meeting or at separate meetings put out the vote then to approve the document and then we don't have to have a all encompassing three partnership meeting again. Okay. Bob? Um, if these boards can meet jointly and only meet one and they only need to meet the one time and they're all in agreement, I can pull the selectmen to meet as soon as possible after that with a single agenda item if three of you can make it. Um, but I suggest you discuss this a little more tonight to see if you're comfortable with that approach that as long as they're in agreement that you would be in agreement with that so that at a moment's notice, for instance, three of you might meet That's before 40, the 26th. Then the only caveat. Hours, no. Yes, well, <laughs> 48 hours. Not at a moment's notice. <laughs> now, well, the way government works, 48 hours. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I guess the only caveat is if there are changes from what the document we reviewed over the weekend, mm -hmm. I'd like a chance to peek at those as well. Okay, well, if they actually can approve it on, on the 13th, then you'll have some time to do that. Yeah. And I will attempt to get Eric Russell from my office to that meeting. Right. Uh, okay. if, if, so, okay. Eric is the person in my office who's actually been involved in all the drafting right. Of, right. Uh, of this and working with, with the two commissions. I can't promise his time because he's not here to defend himself. But um, well, that's the best time. They, <laughs> <laughs> but um, and it does look like he has something in the late afternoon in the city in Boston. So, as long as you you know have to meet at six thirty, I think he'll probably be able to do it. But I okay. should I should probably um, okay. verify that with him. 
<laughs> rather than just say, oh, sure, he can make a 730. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually have jury duty that day. Oh, boy. I'm assuming I'll be <laughs> released. I, I, I will not be seated. But. He'll be sequestered. <laughs> yeah. Virginia, did you have a question? Yes, Virginia. I was a member of both commissions, and um, <coughs> I had an opportunity to read the high copy because I received my copy early today, being coming down to town hall. Uh, and I could see no substantial um, changes that would make either commission nervous. So um, I think we've got a document that's very okay. close to. Good. Should I say perfection? <laughs> well, you that. found two typos, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so. It's closer now. <laughs> she said close to perfection. Okay. okay. All right, very good. So that's our plan of record. You guys will meet on the 13th. 13th. And we'll reconvene on the 26th on the question. Sorry to have you come in, but it was good, good we got this covered. Thank you anyway. Thank you. You need to adjourn your meetings. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Why don't we take a minute here while the room is sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in. Yeah. <sighs>
I think that it, it's unfortunate. I think this all started two and a half months ago or something like that. Um, and and I was at that meeting where where the, the board uh, considered appointing uh, the new hire as their designee. And um, I haven't seen, and maybe there has been unknown to me, but I haven't seen ever, it seems like it was something that could, where we should have sat down with the Board of Health, or some of us should have sat down with the entire Board of Health and hashed this out in a meeting to try to get uh, sort of some sort of agreement, understand what their concerns were in more, in more depth uh, up front. Um, and then I, I think positions just got entrenched after that. Um, I know the, it was at a, the first meeting I was at, and the, the town's health agent d decided not to give the Board of Health the health reports for the month. Now, having been on the Board of Health, we, we have to have, they have to have, we at the time, those health reports to make sure that state law um, is being met and that and the, and the, the public health is protecting the town. So uh, that, that caused me some concern that it took a while for, that those health reports were not forthcoming by the, the new hiree in the, in the health division. Um, so, I, and I could go on and on, I'm sure you don't want to listen to me r ramble. But um, those are some of the current concerns that I have. And, and, and again, I, I, I think this is not a, a good precedent to set. I think that it sends a strong message to other volunteer boards, communities, and commissions that if they do not behave in a way that the Board of Selectmen like, they could be hauled in and, and, and put to a similar question. Yeah, I, I have to stop you there. Sure. You, you can't put those words in any of our mouths. It has nothing to do with what we like, in my opinion. Mm. And I would hold someone whose personal preference um, guided their professional judgment as, as having a problem. Mm -hmm. We don't do this because we like to do it. I, I certainly don't. I won't speak for the rest of you. Um, I think we do this out of a sense of duty and out of a last resort. And the circumstance, as you pointed out earlier, has been going on for some number of months. The Board of Health as the responsibility, as the uh, primary health uh, point of contact, and it delegates that right to a daytime government resource known as the health agent. Until they make that appointment, the Board of Health retains that responsibility. So in doing so, it puts itself in the position of having to respond without mm -hmm. a resource to do it. I, yeah, I, I have to respond to that. I, I don't... Yeah. I just am responding to the comment that we would, that a board, would, would haul individuals in to use to say as you said because we don't like it I because I mean, there was no there didn't seem to me any okay. effort from the get-go okay. to work with that board so that's the perception but that's I can't, how I, see I can't it. square that comment with your earlier comment which is provide a hands-off approach you're now describing that we should work with them on a hands-on fashion I think if you would like to get involved in the Board of Health Matters in that way I'm just I'm responding to your comments there's a there's a good way to to go about doing. Let me go around the table, Barry. So, I think of all the two years that I've been on the board of selectmen, this issue has been probably the most troubling for me personally that I've seen. Um, I've been a volunteer in this town for 20 odd years, um, and I've worked with hundreds of other volunteers in this town for 20 odd years, all of whom don't earn a dime. All of them will have better things to do. Um, and Different things to do. <laughs> different, <laughs> different, different things to do. Um, and, and, and people do it out of sort of a labor of love for their town. They, we're a richer town for it. Um, you know, I worked in the city of Boston, and you know, if the mayor of the city of Boston wanted something, it happened. If the mayor of Boston didn't want something, it didn't happen. End of story. You can have all the volunteers you want. This is a much different form of government. Um, that said, the fact that we are pretty much a government of volunteers with a, with a pretty thin, as you all know, daytime staff, um, it becomes an, it incumbent upon us to do things the right way. Um, you know, listening to that, to that discussion with the Board of Health and with Ray and, and with us the other night, um, I, I really couldn't believe what I was hearing. 
Um, and what it really came down to me, um, you know, augmented by you know some of the emails that we have gotten, was really um, a shoving contest between a board that wanted to have a say in hiring the daytime government person, uh, not just a say, but to actually be the decision maker, um, and the town with our charter that basically says it's the town manager's right and responsibility to appoint the health agent. And, and so round and round and round it about it went for, for, for months. Um, when it, and Ray's memo was crystal clear that the Board of Health, as much as it probably wants to, it has, a, has a close working relationship with the agent, does not have the ability or the authority to hire the person that will be the agent. They have an obligation and a duty to appoint that person to do the business of the board during um, periods of time where they're, where they're not meeting. And it just seemed to me that, you know, while we are volunteers, if I, I work for a bank, if, if the chief legal counsel of the bank told me my way of originating loans was wrong um, and that it posed the bank reputational risk and a risk that the, 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 po the depositors funds, and I continue to keep trying to do that, I would be fired. No ifs, ands, or buts. I would be fired. And just because the fact that we're a group of volunteers, I think we should be held to the same standard of how we would do our day-to-day -day jobs that we actually get paid for. And what I saw was um, a disagreement about who had the authority to hire the health agent. And when told, that they do not have the authority to hire the health agent. They continued a, a, a back, you know, back door way to try to hire their own person by withholding the appointment and using, to me, what seemed like a flimsy excuse of a $5 charge on, uh, on a travel report. Um, you know, we've got a lot of important things to do. Um, and, and so, you know, we wasted a lot of time and a lot of energy um, and, and caused a lot of um, anxiety by basically, um, by the board, not following town charter. So no one values volunteerism more in this town than I do. Um, I, I think that we're richer for it. Um, but that, just because we're volunteers, doesn't mean that we act in a silo. It means that we all should be rowing in the same direction the mission of Reading and not using these things as a way, um, you know, to kind of, you know, because we think we can, you know, a, 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 a board thinks they have a better way of doing it. It broke my heart to hear Beth Sherwin resign. Um, she's a dedicated person. She works hard. Um, and how we got here, I, you know, I, I think we have to do a really deep postmortem on this. And maybe it's up to us as the board to kind of say, okay, we're appointing you to do this role, but maybe we need to get people together on different boards to say, you know, what's the mission of the town of Reading? What is it that we're trying to do? Not to get involved in people's sandboxes, certainly not, um, but, but just to kind of basically, um, once you're appointed to a board, you know, yes, you're responsible for, for working on that board and you have your rules and your regulations on that, but it's also important to understand what you're doing for the town of Reading. Um, and, to, and, and in my view, I, I, unless someone can give me evidence to the contrary, um, you know, members of the board tried to, you know, subvert the hiring process, and the result, I think, left this town vulnerable. That's just not acceptable. Um, but I hope that we can work, that we can figure out ways that we can bring boards together. Um, you know, that's just my view from this perch here. I wasn't the liaison. I wasn't on the board out. Um, but you know. That's how I see it, and you know, I, 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 I want to find a way out of this. I want to move the board to help forward. They have a lot of work to do. So. Why did you say that they you know, tried? Hang on, they hang tried on. to change the hiring hang on, hang on process. It. Bob, oh, thank you. I just want to. You know what I'm about to say, but I want to make sure I say it publicly. Um, since I've been town manager, the, the hiring process for the board of health has been very inclusive, even though it's not required by the charter. I am the sole hire of my charter. When Andy was chair, we had a committee that hired, and you've heard a little about that. What you may not know, and I normally wouldn't go here, is um, when we had the prior hiring process, 
we hired Andy's top choice. We offered the job to Andy's top choice, not mine. That's how strongly the group of, of volunteers got together and worked, and, and employees. And I was outvoted whatever it was to one, that there was a better choice than my choice. I could have just said, too bad. I'm going with my choice. I didn't. I, I, I accepted the will of the majority, if you will, and especially the expertise in the room. And we made an offer to the other fellow who ended up turning it down. We ended up hiring, if you will, the second choice. Uh, in this go-round, again, I offered to the chair or any one member to be uh, you know, present and participate in that hiring process. Uh, both the chair and myself sat in on exactly one round of interviews at the very end. Um, he could not have been sh any stronger for agreeing with the choice that was unanimous about the person we hired. Um, so I just want to make sure the record is clear that this is not an autocratic town manager doing whatever he wants. I'm an extremely inclusive, open-door guy for almost all matters. I do have responsibility at the end of the day, sometimes some tough calls, and I will make those. Um, but the hiring process is, is I, as I've said to the board in the past, I think it's the single most important thing I do. And as some of you know from being included in some of the hiring processes, I like other input. I value other input. So just to be clear, the Board of Health did have a very important role in both of those hires. Uh, but the whole board cannot because the process of uh, applying for a job must be confidential. We advertise it as such. As soon as a second member, including an associate member of the Board of Health, stepped into a hiring process, it becomes a public matter. And that's why, after repeated requests for them to join in the hiring <coughs> process, I kept trying to explain no because it's a confidential process and the chair has decided to act on your behalf. So I just wanted to make sure that part was clear. I'm, I'm confused. Um, as I recall, the Board of Health was not trying to challenge uh, Bob's hiring authority. Um, rather, I think they were following uh, town charter bylaws. Bill, you'll have to help me here if I'm uh, off base. But I think where so so I don't I'm I'm, I'm confused as to where you got the idea that the, that the Board of Health wanted to fire or not hire or reverse the hire of uh, or, or chain challenge Bob's hiring authority. It was their appointment, um, and which is per the bylaws or charter, that they, they, that they have a right to, they may appoint a designee or they may appoint uh, an agent on their behalf. Um, but that's where the, the, the sticking point was. Um, I don't think they were trying to take over the hiring process. I, at least I never heard that. Yeah, I, I think that's a symptom of a problem, not necessarily. I don't understand. If you look at things sometimes as um, inputs rather than outputs, it's, not a, it's an issue in its own right, but it's part of a larger uh, pattern. You start to see, you start to see things differently. Well, the way I mean, they ha when they appoint the Board of Health answers to the state law, and they when they appoint somebody, they have to trust yeah. that person to represent them legally. But in this case, the town manager has the sole and exclusive prerogative to hire. Sure, and they have a requirement to appoint. Not arguing. And that, yeah, I, that is there? It, I don't. Is there? A, I didn't. Couldn't find a requirement to appoint in the town charter or bylaws. It's in a no. letter. No, there they, isn't. There is isn't there a requirement? requirement? Ray opined in his letter of July 17th that they ought to do the appointment. But are okay. they required to? So the, the state law simply authorizes it. And so you, yeah. you were looking in the wrong place if you were looking in the charter. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you should have been looking in the yeah, statute. I, I, I right? get them okay. all yeah. jumbled okay. together. It authorizes the appointment to be made. Right. And the, the idea of this appointment is public health, unlike most other kinds of things that, that come up before the town, mm -hmm. requires a, often requires some kind of an immediate response. Correct. And um, uh, it's not always possible for the Board of Health to um, exercise its power mm -hmm. as a board, uh, as a board yeah. conveniently yeah. or, you know, yeah. quickly enough. Yeah. Um, uh, that, you know, they have to find when people can meet and, mm -hmm. you know, they're volunteers, yeah. as you yeah. know, they work and whatever. So the law says and this is unique for the health agent. The law says that all of the power of the Board of Health can be 
and can be delegated to yeah. an agent who can exercise it as if that agent were the Board of Health. Right, right. And um, so it's uh, so it's a, a unique authority, but it's something that that's critical to the operation of, yes. of the public health process. Yes. You know, um, unless uh, the Board of Health is going to sort of meet constantly to uh, to address right. things. Yeah. So it, it is it is certainly not required that they that they delegate that authority to anybody in particular. Right. And they own it. But they they either need to. If they're not going to delegate it to uh, somebody, then you're left with the problem that there is no nobody with the requisite authority to respond in certain circumstances. Right. Yeah, and I, I understand that they were de they they were delayed in appointing somebody because they wanted to work things out. That's at least what I picked up and, from and the meeting. I want to go around the table once okay. to make sure, sure. we all. Yeah. yeah. Um, I really want to say more than I probably can say here. Bob, can we say anything about the uh, HR study that examined leakage of information of the candidates? The only thing about HR that I feel that I can say, and, and Ray's not going to like it either, but um, just for clarification of everyone, we have two attorneys. We have an HR specialist, if you will, and we have town council. Um, on occasion, they're both on the phone with me. That's, that's pretty rare. Um, I feel comfortable enough, and I generally don't like to talk about HR because it's not public, but I will tell you and tell the public that the letter after the public health nurse resigned that she sent out did come into my uh, possession at some point, um, along with a request to have a legal review. Uh, that is HR. That is Labor Council. That is not Town Council. Labor Council told me that the town, that myself, had no standing with a former employee to question the former employee. Case closed. We could not do it. Just because she's a former employee? Because she's she a left. former employee, right. we did not dismiss her, we did not terminate her, we did not leave with any bad sense that if she wished to talk to any of us, of course, we were welcome to do it. But he said, under no circumstances should you or any employee of this town contact that employee to ask her questions. Including any member of any board? That's correct. Who are technically employees That of the is town. correct. So I, I don't like saying that in public because it's an HR issue and it doesn't, it's not the business of the public. But in this instance, I feel obliged to say it. Yeah. We are taking care of our HR responsibilities here, even though I can't always tell you the details. Right, there's a lot going on. Um, to amplify a little bit what Barry said, we, we are so dependent and so thankful for our volunteers. And fortunately, it's rare that um, it's necessary to to speak to a volunteer. Most folks are willing to listen to a chair or to s spend some time understanding the office and come up to speed. But where circumstances dictate it, it's, our, it's incumbent on our responsibility to use the resources and the recourse that's given to us in the charter and the bylaws. Right. And while we should be reluctant to do so, we shouldn't be resistant to doing it and when it's appropriate. And in this circumstance, given the facts been discussed here and some of which we can't talk about here it's wholly appropriate to have this discussion this was delayed but I don't think we can deny it any longer I'm thankful for their service and I mean that sincerely these people care about what they do it's simply that the path they were going down wasn't one that the town could entertain any longer um, and so re the, the discussion we had last week had to happen and the discussion we're having tonight has to conclude any last closing comments? I have one. John. Um, at the risk of being redundant, and I do not want to be redundant, I do want to say that I think that Barry articulated exactly the way I feel about this situation from the top to the bottom. And frankly, you know, we found ourselves in a very difficult position, and it is our responsibility to fix it. And I think we need to do that. Um, I, I I thought that Barry's comments were well placed and reflect my my feeling on the subject very precisely. Thank you, John. If there are no other questions, I do have um, <coughs> one or two comments for the chair of the board of health, um, John. You were. Yeah, it's way in the back. 
Um, you were party to the to meetings where the health uh, agent candidates were uh, discussed, and as Ray mentioned, or I think Bob might have mentioned it, you were in, in favor of the ultimate decision. Right? Yes, I was. There was no formal vote taken, but you were in favor of it. Correct. There was no vote. Okay. Um, in the Board of Health meetings, which you did chair, um, how many how many opportunities did you either ask for a motion or make the motion yourself? I think I made the motion twice to a point. And did you ask others in, in other meetings to, to move above and beyond those two? In other meetings outside of public meetings? You can either make the motion directly or ask for a motion. If you, if you made it directly twice, were there others where you asked for it to be made? I believe I just asked. I think you did on the 16th. You're forgetting the 16th. Thank you. Okay, so on two you or three. For a okay. Yeah, I, what I read was you asked for a motion, none came. And you made a motion oh, okay. twice. I, I did ask for right. a motion. Three okay. separate occasions. No you made tried enough. to initiate, you know, a movement towards appointment. That's what I read in, you know, my reading of the minutes. And, and what was the reaction of the Board of Health members present to the request, either the motion or the request for a motion. What was the, was there no discussion? Well, there was no second. Uh, I did, I do remember discussing that I did bring the, the issue as it was here tonight for uh, to the town manager. Mm -hmm. And I thought I got a reasonable response from the town manager that would allow me to feel comfortable making a motion. Were you, did you attempt um, to mediate any of the differences among the members, or? Uh, we didn't really do much as far as HR talk. We were kind of told we weren't allowed to speak of that. Right, but in terms of trying to get to a motion, did you try to bridge any of the gaps, or was it simply not possible to get them comfortable with the thought of making a motion? Well, as John, I said, I, I maybe I, Keep in mind that the Board of Health is only three members. I understand. So the only communications that can Very exist right. between the members has to be at, at a meeting. Oh, so right. This unfortunately is is a circumstance where the where the open meeting law sometimes gets in the way of you know resolving okay. issues I, like that. I did through through Jim, yeah. uh, give my opinion of the importance of having a health agent. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a technical point on that. Uh, one way uh, John has communicated with his board members is to send a communication to Gene, who then blind copies it to the other two. Does that constitute a deliberation or not if the communication is only one way from him to them? If it's. You don't really want me to answer that question right now, do you? <laughs> is there any way that can be done without. Is that material to the, to the next? It depends on the subject matter. All right. If it's not That's in the meeting side. logistics, I guess I'd say, yeah. then you stray into dangerous territory. Yeah. Okay. That's all the questions I had. Any other comments or questions? If not, I'll, I'll move to a motion. Well, do you want to talk about the procedure you've uh, thought through here? Yeah. So um, the process here is we're, we're going to make uh, two motions following the resignation tonight um, and ask the board to vote on the removal of the two remaining. Um, not the removal. Yeah. To, to uh, I'm sorry for a hearing process for a hearing. Thank you. Which to would actually uh, no issue a notice issue of a notice of hearing which would conduct on the 26th of August. Right. Thank you. Um, September. September. You just said August. September 26. September 26. Time is flying. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman. May I offer both at once so they can both be discussed together? Sure. We'll uh, actually, no. Let, let's do them. Se let's do them separately. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, move to file a notice of removal with the Reading Town Clerk pursuant to Section 8.12.1.A of the Reading Home Rule Charter for the following individual holding the following office. John Costigan, Chair of the Board of Health. The reasons cited for the proposed removal are as follows. One, failure to act on the appointment of the health agent, Laura Blasick, as the authorized agent of the Board of Health. Two, Pursuing lines of questioning and taking individual actions and votes regarding Ms. Vlasic that have exceeded the Board of Health's lawful duties and powers under the Massachusetts General Laws and the Reading Home Rule Charter and Bylaws. Thank you, Dan. 
Do I have a second for the motion? So, um, I think we have to have a second so that we can have a discussion. Right, correct. So I will second it so that we can have a discussion. Okay. We have a motion that seconded. Any further discussion on the motion? Could uh, you explain this? I think we've talked about the, the first one at length, and I, I understand when I'm outgunned. But on the second one, um, could you explain that to me? Any more detail? There, uh, these motions have all been made at town council suggestion identically. Uh, I do not believe the second part applies to Mr. Costigan. And I do not believe he willfully failed to act. So uh, this is more of a motion being made to dispense with the situation in terms of Mr. Costigan. I'm going to vote against the motion because I don't think either of these points was made. But it, it's it's here, simply here a town council suggestion as a common format for each. But to answer three. the question directly, this is exceeding the authority that granted to the board of health is, is the is the reason given in the board. <coughs> so if they don't apply to John, why are they here? I don't know what the will of the board is. We just had a. a hearing you don't believe week. they apply to John? Vote against right. the motion. Point of this no, is but, but I, who 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 made who who penned the motion? The request of the, the board, this board, was to understand what reasons would apply to removal of any or all of members of the Board of Health. Um, working with town council, there are two obvious ones. One is the failure to act on the appointment, which is a de facto statement. And the second is uh, pursuing lines of questioning and exceeding authority, which we've heard tonight. Right. I, I just, this is the, I didn't know that we were pursuing the, the we discussed them at a previous meeting and I was uh, not paying attention. I have no idea. If so we discussed them at a previous meeting, this, these, these, these topics. But not between our last meeting and tonight, no. So, Aaron? this is a clarification question. So, if we vote positively on this, this is just to have a hearing. Correct. Right. If we vote in this, we're not removing any no, of the but you're issuing a notice of removal to the town clerk, which would be, have to be timely filed tomorrow to, to, to start a 20-day clock that would, the earliest we could have the hearing would be the 21st then. 26th. I'm sorry, 26th. At that point, in, in accordance with the bylaw, uh, the person for whom the notice was uh, registered would be able to offer defense to these reasons. They could even bring counsel, they could bring witnesses, anything they want. So it's really, it's more of an indictment. Think of it that way, than yeah, the trial. It's a motion for hearing. Yeah, okay. motion for hearing. So it's not, that, so it's not voting, to, no. it's basically to. Hmm. And these vote. motions are identical. Right. Yeah. Sometimes grand juries vote no bills, meaning there's nothing here. So any further discussion? So. When we come to a vote, are we talking about both motions? No. The other one hasn't been made yet. We're doing them individually. Okay. So this is strictly... I only made it for cost again. It's tied to the chair. Yes. Correct. Okay. And uh, this is the prerogative of the chair. I'm going to ask for a roll call vote um, in terms of the dis your disposition on this question. Um, all those in favor of the motion... John? Halsey? We just state our preference, I guess. No. Dan Ensmeyer? No. Barry Berman? Yes. No. Andy, Fr Andy, Andy Friedman. Friedman? No. no. And John Arena is no. It's four to one, the motion fails. So the motion fails to pass. Thank you. Next. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to skip Elizabeth as she has resigned. Uh, move to file a notice of removal with the Reading Town Clerk pursuant to Section 8.1. 12.1.A of the Reading Home Rule Charter for the following individual holding the following office. Nancy Doctor, Associate Member of the Board of Health. Reasons cited for the proposed removal are as follows. One, failure to act on the appointment of the health agent, Laura Vlasic, as the authorized agent of the Board of Health. Two, pursuing lines of questioning and taking individual actions and votes regarding Ms. Vlasic that have exceeded the Board of Health's lawful duties and powers under the Massachusetts General Laws and the Reading Home Rule Charter and Bylaws. Do I have a second? Second. 
at a second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask for a roll call vote. John Halsey? Yes. Dan Ensmeyer? Yes. Barry Berman? Yes. Andy Friedman? No. And John Arena votes yes. So that's 4-1. <coughs> uh, the consequence of this is this. There's another motion at the end. Oh, yeah, I'll make that. Thank you. Uh, Ray, do we need to make any motion about the timely posting, or is that just assumed to happen tomorrow? Because the 26 doesn't you don't work. Need, you don't need to, okay. uh, to make a, include that in the motion. Thank you. I think. Um, All right. I further move that the public hearing on such removals be held at the Board of Selectmen regular meeting of 926 2017, and that the town clerk be directed to give notice of such hearing to Nancy Doctor not less than five days prior to the hearing in accordance with section 8.12.2 of the Reading Home Rule Chart. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Any further discussion on the motion? Just one point of clarification. Yes. Um, uh, you should be reminded that we count days fun in a funny way under the charter. So the five-day notice means five days that town hall is open. Mm. Okay. But the 20 is calendar days? 20 is calendar days. Okay. That's right. So, it's less than 10. More. Right. Okay. okay. So the notice needs to be given no later than the 18th. Okay. Does that need to be in there? Or is that understood? It's understood. Okay. No, it's understood. I mean, that, that's what the charter said, but it's, good to it's right. sufficiently confusing no. that you should always be reminded well, when, yeah. when, when something important is yes, happening. Doesn't it seem, look, it seems to me that that's the time it has to be done by. That's right. More notice is better. Absolutely. Right. Um, so I think we should act with all due haste and yeah, right. give notice. Right. Yeah. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, this is a show of hands. Did he make the motion? Yeah, we do. Oh, okay. We just do all the roll call at this point. Um, yeah. No, I'm going to yeah, do a show right. of hands. This is sufficient. Your call. All those in favor? Those opposed? opposed? I'm not. Abstaining? Yeah. You're abstaining. abstaining. Okay, so. 410. Sorry, 310. 401. Thank you. We're 40. Sorry. Did you I'm have on, a, I'm on, you the have wrong, a medical I'm on the wrong time zone tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough travel. All right. No. Okay, that concludes our discussion, our topic, the 30 topics. Um, we're about five minutes ahead for our uh, next topic. If you want, we can go to approval of the minutes. Sure. Chair and move to uh, approve the minutes of July 25th, 2017 you, as amended. Yes, thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, any further discussion on the minutes of July 25th? I'll ask for yes. Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor of the, of the minutes of July 25th, 2017, raise your hand. I wasn't there after the same. Okay, so we have 401. Yep. <laughs> no. no corrections, thank you. You're home free. <laughs> um, technically, it could start early. It's not a public hearing, but if you want to wait. Um, I can't. It's unusual for folks to show up yeah, at 934 for any yeah. portion of this meeting. So, yeah. Um, do you want to bring up the slides you had in the packet? On yeah, the that's screen? what I exactly what I'm looking for. I think it's on uh, 5D1. Packs past all the historic. Mm -hmm. oh, must be getting close. <laughs> oh, it's an earlier version. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Oh, come on. Ready? Go ahead. Okay. Um, just to be clear, um, I, if the board wishes to change the current practice, I would strongly advise having a public hearing, advertising it, notifying people, and doing that as quickly as possible. But it's not the objective tonight for you to change um, what the current practice is, just to indicate your interest in, in change and setting that as a future agenda. Um, Bob, I have a question yeah. about that. John, please. What is the deadline? 
I, I know that when we discussed um, this, you know, we, we let me go get the police. Get this thing the chief earlier, is out there. you know. And, yeah. Um, let me get him. He's the expert. Just see if he's got to know when it, you know, when the when the deadline right. is, is the changes to be made. Let's see this page. I got package. It's it tonight's package. What's the page now? It's in, the, it's in the Thursday. 42. Okay, it's in the Thursday pack. Okay. No, it's in no. tonight's too. Okay, thank you. What page is Sorry. 42. It's 42. John, if you wouldn't mind restating that question. Yeah. I was wondering what the what the deadline was for if, if a change in these fees was to happen, what would the deadline be for us to, to do that? Because I know last year when we discussed this as a possibility, we'd actually pass the deadline. So yeah, and just to be clear, um, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, the price is not on the sticker. Correct. So right. that's more of a communication, I would say, public relations mm -hmm. issue. Right. So you have two logistical questions. One is when do you need to order stickers, and if the board is going to split stickers to have two different types. Right. And then the other is, what's the earliest that people start buying next year's stickers so that they have some notice of when, yeah. when the price has changed? So normally we start ordering by now to the end of September is when stickers are ordered for next year. And they usually start buying them around Thanksgiving. Yeah, Thanksgiving for the following, for the following year. I mean, don't get me wrong, we can hold up as, you know, for a little bit longer, but I mean, I think we or usually it's a solid eight to ten weeks sometimes. Well, if they were split, back. you could have a second sticker for Absolutely. one or the other. Yep. So I think if the board um, is willing to take this up at your first agenda in uh, October, that would be okay. Still? Yeah, I think so. What kind Sounds of like ten days would be, into October? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can order however many stickers. Sure, yeah. Because we can't let, you know, yeah. we can't let this discussion get away from us. Yeah, and there's it a meeting on the did last year because, yes, it did. you know. And there's yeah, a the meeting we on took the 26th. It up the Correct. Yeah. It was too late. Okay. Yeah, it, you have an agenda that's reasonably full on the 26th, but it can always come there if you wish. Okay. Uh, you know, you'll see it. It's crowded. Um, just to give you some background on the sticker, it's a $25 price. There is a senior discount. Of, it's $15 if you prove that you're over age 65. We don't take your word. There's additional household discount of $10 each, but that's if you buy them at the same right. exact instant right. that you buy the $25 one, as I found out to my discouragement a few years ago. Me too. You don't take <laughs> so my word? Uh, on you being 65? Yes. No, you'd have to prove that to me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe that. It's unfair. <laughs> There's a small chart there <laughs> showing uh, how many stickers have been bought in the recent uh, several years. On average, it's just under 4,000. Um, six or seven years ago, when I last brought this in front of that board, the question was asked, why do people buy stickers? And there's no way to know. Uh, my answer was both reasons. Many people's answers were both reasons. Um, at the time, we looked at monthly data of purchase. And it seemed like a reasonable answer that people that bought them between uh, Thanksgiving and January, February were buying them for the train station. That doesn't mean they were commuting every day, but it means they had an interest in having it before you would do compost work generally. And that was about 25% of the stickers. Uh, during the spring and fall seasons of composting, if you will, that accounted for about 50% of the stickers. And again, we can't say no one was also interested in the trains, but you know, it's a pattern. And then the rest of the year was the rest of the stickers. So it didn't tell you anything inclusively other than there's a lot of people that seem to be buying this for the compost you know, Probably half, if you add it all up at least. But that was six years ago, right? And that was six years ago, and the pattern has not changed. But that was be th and that was before we started picking, doing curbside. Yes, so I'll get to that oh, um, on a different memo. The amount of trips to the compost center is substantially lower. Um, but as you can see, the amount of stickers sold is not. And again, when you can buy one sticker for $25 for either purpose, it's kind of irrelevant. It, it, yeah, you, you know, how many times are you going to do either? It's just, Doesn't I want matter. a sticker. So, um, on average, our revenue has been $80,000, uh, roughly in line with that uh, graph there over the last several years. Um, and as it turns out, because of those two discounts, 
and certain people are eligible for free ones. I can't remember the details, but I know you guys know. Um, the average price is between 20 and $21 of revenue for the average sticker that's out there. Um, Bob, why the two dips in the curve? Are those are months along the... Yeah. Those are years. Those are annual. Don't know. I mean, it's, okay. I didn't buy one in both of those years, so okay. maybe there was a reason. I, I have no idea. You know, it's not it's that much of a dip. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say it's 3,400 to 4,000, yeah. so Got it. order of magnitude. Um, what I have suggested or, or will suggest is that the town offer a compost center only sticker and then a second sticker that can do both, which is what we have now. Know, following up on the earlier discussion from Mr. Brown about uh, you can only charge what it costs, which I obviously agree with. Um, we spend about $70,000 a year to run the compost center, and that's hard costs that I can show you. Most of them are wages, some of them are tax workers, and some of them are expenses. Um, if you went to a $20 compost only sticker, as an example, um, that would probably yield at least fifty thousand dollars of revenue, and I, I at least would be comfortable that that's covering our cost or close enough. Um, on the high end, I think you could go to thirty thousand dollars, and we could argue that somewhere between twenty and thirty, it's covering thirty dollars. Thirty dollars. I'm sorry, thirty dollars yeah. per sticker. So currently, it's twenty-five. It's right in the ballpark of what it costs to run the compost center mm -hmm. purely. Um, it's a lot harder for me to give you that kind of guess on the depot. So, Bob, why wouldn't you leave it at 25 for compost only? Because it you sounds can. like that, you know, it Absolutely sounds like that's can. very close. Yep. If you had a sit, and the reality is that, you know, you may not sell as many compost stickers because you're not combining them anymore. Right. So, I think to reduce that um, leaves you open to. You know, to not covering your costs, and you should cover your. We should be covering our costs of composting. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I'll just say, it's from experience, um, you really need to have exact change when you're buying a sticker. And a twenty is a lot easier to have than twenty-five, as Let's I found out the hard way. No. Checks. Uh, do you take checks? Yes, you do. Yeah, yes, yes, you do. Yes, no yes you do. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to follow up on this point, though, while we're on the compost center, this is the amount of annual trips. And I had to write this uh, memo to CPDC um, a couple days ago. This is the, this period of here is the result of us adding leaf collections, which cost us money in the 10-year uh, rubbish contract. It's not free. Uh, but it has greatly reduced, as you can see, the number of trips to the compost center, um, mm -hmm. you know, by 10, 15 percent. And again, we have a growing population, not a shrinking one, so it's at least better. Um, I just thought it was important that you see that. So I, I can't tell you how many stickers would you sell. I would guess that the reduced compost centers trips are not necessarily reduced customers as, as one to one. I put out bags for leafside pickup. I also go to the compost center. I just don't go as often as I used to. Is anyone not going at all? <coughs> probably some, but probably not as many as do what I do, <coughs> which is both. You're leaving out the social aspects of the compost. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Come on. Yes, I, I am. And, and the there's a lot going on over there. The joy of being in the mud. <laughs> and, and who has gotten all their leaves up, really, <laughs> in time for the collection? Yeah, well, there is that, too. <laughs> Plus, you got to leave it open for a month. And, 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 and no matter what we do, it's the wrong answer for the right. season. Of course. Who knows when the leaves are going to They've already started to fall. It's, it's summer. Um, so, again, tonight's... Tonight's meeting is merely to gauge the board's interest in doing a split and um, the discussion, the heavy discussion, to become an all right. day. I'm interested in the split, but uh, I have an information. Uh, what is the, the annual MBTA assessment to the town? Right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting you say that. I was going to ask Ray, but I never did. Um, let's move over now to the, the train station, the depot. Yep. Um, the, in the packet tonight, Chief Sagala gave you a memo describing all the different parking variations downtown. Right different kind of business stickers and the resident stickers. There is over 500 spaces that are used pretty much daily, maybe not in the summer so intensely, for daily commuters. Um, anecdotally, from the patterns I told you, as many as a thousand people may be buying a sticker that have interest in parking for some period of time at the depot for 25 bucks. 
<coughs> that could be as little as uh, seven or eight times a year mm -hmm. just to have the flexibility. So it's probably a reasonable thing to say somewhere between 500 or 1,000 or park with parking in mind, but that's a really wide range. If you start thinking of what it costs, I, I can't easily give you a cost. We would really have to work on that. As was mentioned in an email to you uh, over the weekend, um, there is significant costs of snow plow. I asked town council, but I've not yet a chance to follow up um, if we can recover loss of state aid with a fee. And the way the state laws work, the answer is almost always no, because it's logical. <laughs> um, because we have a train station, we are docked somewhere between five and six hundred thousand dollars of right. state aid directly. It's right on the cherry sheet. You can't miss it. If we were North Reading and we did not have that, we would get that much more state aid. Yeah. Just to be really clear. So what, what's so the, the rationale for withholding state aid if you have transportation that you can recover costs elsewhere? Because the MBTA needs to be funded. Right. And we are one of the methods that they are funding. So is it the towns that directly benefit, if you will, from funded. having an MBTA presence pay some amount. We pay five, six hundred thousand. So could you justify as a recovery of direct costs dividing the six hundred thousand by the I don't know that's the right question. My guess is no. Well, let's pursue but that. I'm, I'm happy to follow up with Ray. Yeah. And I, I think you can make a time of day like we do now. Before 1030, you need the sticker. If it's a casual parker. Yeah, that's out of, you Enforcement's know, a whole nother. They issue. would need a sticker to park other than those hours. The presentation I gave to the board s several years ago was uh, at the time, and, and since the MBTA is charging four bucks a day, mm -hmm. um, yeah. presuming there are at least some commuters that are using it daily, the average commuter spends 220 days working, vacation, holidays, mm -hmm. all that, uh, you know, otherwise it'd be higher. They're spending 880 bucks. And um, you'll recall that uh, some number of years ago, we removed the out-of-town residents yeah. or the sticker for out-of-town folks to buy it. They used to park the end of Haven. We sold those to businesses. I don't remember what we were charging, but that was fully subscribed very quickly, yeah. I remember, every year. And I personally know some folks that lived in North Reading that were always thrilled to come down and do that. And they were, they're they now coming and paying four bucks a day or they're going over to Woburn. But the MD, MBTA lot is not fully subscribed. It's really um, I would say now it's, it's pretty, pretty close. Full. Yeah, it's pretty busy. Yeah, at least in the last and, year. And there's been no so. challenge to that fee as being unrealistic or not. The $4? Yeah. Set by the state. Who's going to charge? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point I'm making is with, with if we set something like $4 a day, are, are we within our same rights? Or I don't. That's for another day. <laughs> that is well, a question. We're talking about it's a fair question. question. Well, there's, I mean, the thing is, is that if, it, you know, there's a, there's the temptation to try to, you know, set this fee a little bit higher to offset costs and, and, and increase revenue. So I use myself as kind of an example. I, I'm, I'm happy to pay the $25 fee. I probably go down and park at the depot to take the train probably about twice a month. So to me, that's worth it. At a certain point, if it gets raised too, too high, I might just pay the $4 a day at the MPTA one, which, by the way, the town gets zero for. Yeah. So we don't want to discourage people from kind of using that. And I know when I use the train station, um, every single car that's parked along uh, in that parking lot, but right by the tracks and along, I forget the name of the street, all those people have stickers. So, yeah. um, you know, and it's... You can't. You cannot get a spot on those streets yep. if you come like after eight thirty or yep. nine. If you just wanted to park there casually, you couldn't because it's all taken up by people with stickers. I did have a super secret spot that I. Didn't <laughs> <laughs> At a certain point, if you set that cost Keep too your high, people will find alternative ways. Yes. You know, do we want to encourage or discourage it? That's a different discussion. Well, that goes back to the force. Right, but you know, um, the thing is, whatever we, whatever we have to set it in a way that that people just won't flee, and instead of getting the $25, if we set it at 100 or 150 or 200 or whatever, we get zero because everyone would say, I'm not paying that at all, and I'll park for the $4 a day, um, or they'll find an alternative ways to well, get it. Well, you know, it, does, it seems to me, if you work 50 weeks and you pay two bucks a day, that's 10 bucks for a week's worth of parking if you're a daily commuter. I, I mean, it's the bargain of the century. 500 bucks a year gets you a place to park and to get on the train and save yourself from the wall of traffic that you know goes in and out of Boston yeah. every day. I mean, to me, you know, setting something 
at half the cost of what the MBTA is charging. Um, but, you know, what's, you know, I mean, is that an unreasonable number? I mean, you know, have been, I drove to Boston every day for many, many years. And parking there, besides the torture of getting there, um, $2 a day would have been, I mean. But that's if you use it every day. I, the thing that, the, the, the unknown part of this is how many people use it every day and how many people are like me who might use it twice a month but are glad to have the spot down there and happy to pay this ticket. So that's the, right, I wouldn't pay, because I don't use it every day. You wouldn't pay, wouldn't $500, pay $500 a year. Bucks. I understand. I would, pay, I would pay zero and figure out, I, I drive, and I just drive it. And what would we lose? You lose what my What would the town lose? My $25. Do you go to the compost? Yeah, but you know what the offset is? The You're other. going to the compost, aren't you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> People take it. Yeah, well, as long as you're hiring a writing landscaper, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> the uh, I think the point here is we're looking for price points, and this is a later yeah. discussion to justify yeah. it. Um, if people are, if the world is coming twice a month, and we're occupying, what is it, 800 <coughs> spots? About 500. That means you've got uh, what is that, 7,500 people vying for that spot in order to have the same traffic. So that can't be true. What you're describing, it's probably a blend. But the town is far better <coughs> off to charge a, something closer to a market rate. It would dispose others to find better alternatives. But you know, that's kind of the market economy. There is the MBTA lot. If you were going to go twice a month, you just have to get down there early enough. Back. So, uh, but to remind, rem just re bring it back to something you said, I think, at the beginning of the meeting. Yeah. Aren't we supposed to set it based on the cost to the town? It can't exceed the operational right. cost, right. but it, you may find the operational cost is far in excess. Right. Mm -hmm. we'll right. That is yet so to be. There's an open question as to what that is. Right. I can't answer that tonight. But um, if you're interested, I, I can't answer it though. That'll be a ceiling number. But the question tonight is really: Are you guys willing to entertain the thought of splitting the rate? I think Bill. Bill. Uh, you might want to check with the Wakefield on the Greenwood section. They have a slot you put in two bucks a day. Four. Does that go to Wakefield? Two bucks or four bucks? No, I think it's two. Wakefield. I think it's four because they have all MBTA parking no, no. Wakefield. From, that I know. No, Greenwood? not in the Greenwood section. From okay. the bridge down to the crossing, that's yep. the town of Wakefield. And they, hmm. they do have a slot there to put money in. I think it's two dollars And is it, sorry about this, yes. is it still manual slots? It's not yeah. the smartphone? and. Uh, I, that I don't know. But okay. I, the last time I knew it was the slots. So. Okay. Are you suggesting there's an opportunity to go to kind of um, <laughs> metering? Well, the MBTA uses smartphones now. Um, I've used that at Wakefield, for instance, as opposed to going here for yeah. free. Okay. Well, you well, also have to look at the cost of you know ins that installation and the cost. Oh, of oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. everything adds money to price. Yeah, you know? And I think a really important thing to look at, and I've done a little research on this. I mean, if you look at <coughs> towns that fit into our, you know, our compare. What do we call that? Peers. Peers. <laughs> Um, that have stations, you know, some are charging, you know, two or three hundred, but the majority of them are five to eight hundred dollars. Yeah. And I think all of them are charging in that general vicinity, um, those that have train stations. So I'm going to take all of this discussion. I'm sorry, Bob. Um, just, it, it's probably obvious, but I still feel like I need to say it. The thing we don't want to do is you set a price so that the lot is empty and these guys are busy chasing people parking in the neighborhood. Right. Yep. Uh, that's the unintended consequence we need to avoid. So I would urge the board, whatever it does, to maybe go a little lower than where you think you want to mm -hmm. be and let's see what happens. Let's see what, what business these folks get. Let's reason. see what kind of data you can collect. What's, in, what's enforcement like now? What do you find in terms of folks who are trying to escape into the neighborhoods? Is it, how would you characterize it? It's not as much a thing as in the neighborhoods as it is for people that are uh, expired stickers and stuff that we actually, cause we, like Barry said, there are stickers, but not everybody has the car here until we fail on the flight. Okay. Uh, those are friendlies. Those aren't folks trying to disappear in the neighborhood. True. Right. right. You haven't seen it too bad in the neighborhoods. No, because no, the neighborhoods are pretty worse. Right. They're self-policing, I'm guessing. The right. neighbors would generally, yeah. it um, used to be the neighbors would call, and then once that happens a few times, people yeah. stop. Yeah, it's the law of unintended consequences. If you make it expensive, very expensive, folks are going to look for a creative alternative. 
Um, again, the to topic of tonight. Is, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa Alvarado, Grand Street. Um, as someone who is um, within walking distance to the train depot, um, I have people in my neighborhood who park from New Hampshire. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have any Grand restricted Street, parking yeah, in my <laughs> area, so there would be no reason for the police to come and mm -hmm. police the area. However, if the parking rate increases exponentially, then that creep is going to. Yeah. Filter out into all. What of street is that? Are you? Yeah, Grand. Grand Street. Yeah. People. Most of Finnsville. That's a long walk from Grand Street, Grand Street to the station. No, not, not, not my section of Grand. I'm um, by the library. Down from Deering Street every day. There's about eight yeah. cars on Deering. Yep. Every day. It's shorter than New Hampshire. That's for sure. Well, that's a good point. Maybe we look for res putting the restricted signs a little bit, a little bit more buffering than we have. They did that on Burning Street, and they moved up to Deering. Yeah. Yep. They're always going to. They're on Mount Vernon, and so they. Come up to Dudley. Okay. Can I just ask sure. a general uh, uh, sort of historical question before we, we, we vote on this? And that is, I, th I think I understand the answer, but um, we charge a fee for uh, parking and compost, but not for, say, I don't know, use of the dog park or the tent. tent. Don't send me kind of e emails about do your dog. I love dogs. Or, or tennis courts or things like that. So well, tennis why, court out of towners it, pay? Out of towners pay. Uh, I'm not sure. Do in towners pay a reduced amount or no? Nothing. So I know well, we have some I, fees you know, for some baseball things fields for are, are, are paid for. Yeah, most things there are. And fees how are we? How are we? How are those fees? How is it determined what we charge fees for and what we don't? Um, there's there's two groups to my knowledge that are most experienced with this. One's the school committee for athletic fees, mm -hmm. and then one's the recreation committee right. for yeah. other fields. Right. I really don't want to answer for them. John has had some experience. Well, they were they were that. out to visit us here yeah. at the board of selectmen before they right. they had the they hadn't updated their fee structure honestly right. in a decade or yeah. longer, yeah. and they put a lot of time and energy in, you know into doing that. Mm -hmm. Into looking at it and looking at a lot of comparables, you know, in, in neighboring peer, peer communities, and they came up with a system of charging. So users pay. Yeah. That's not uncommon. I mean, now if you're from town, you pay certainly a lot less than if you're out of town. Right. So. Is your question how the numbers are arrived at? Or no, 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 no. Just for what f services do we? How do we select? what services we charge fees for and what we don't charge fees for. We charge fees for those things that cost us money. I think is pretty yeah. much the general rule. Yeah. If it costs us something to do it, we attach a fee to it with the goal of, you know, bringing covering our costs. We, we to are able to. I mean, that's kind of the goal. And it's discretionary. You don't right. have to do it. Mm -hmm. We don't do it for everything. Chief, how many, how many spots are in the, the actual, M, the lot? I think I have that here in a memo. Here's first. I love the old man puts his glasses on. <coughs> All right, so the depot commuter parking lot is 96 spots. The depot resident parking lot is 35 spots. So the big the, one to the, the left. Deep, of the depot resident, that's the. The one to the right as you're, as you're facing from yeah, Lincoln Street. Uh, they all look like one lot to me. Anyway. Right. Yeah. But this, they kind of come up with a system a few years ago of how to actually uh, write it down. Vine Street parking lot has 42 spots. Lincoln Street, the north side of Lincoln Street, is 38 spots. But in total, there's 525 resident parking spots available around the depot area. So um, if, if the board is interested in splitting it, or at least continuing the discussion, um, you know, please ask questions. What other information do you need? Uh, I'll try to get some estimate of what it costs to maintain the parking down there, you know, snow plowing and enforcement. And I'll ask the question about loss of state aid. I don't think so. Um, I I, and I, I don't know how other towns justify higher fees. From experience, maybe they didn't do careful accounting as we tend to. They did it more on market supply and demand, and that's a natural instinct yeah, right. for, for a private sector person on a volunteer board to do. Is what does everyone else charge? What is the market? Yeah, what's we the can market charge this. Yeah. 
And you know, yeah, that's okay as a first blush, but then you also have to say, can we justify this? Uh, you know, in your chairs today, uh, the auditors were in, and I would have to justify the fee, perhaps, to the auditors. I mean, people who are here are paying taxes for other things. Shouldn't be expected to pay the same thing, uh, you know, as a, uh, a non-resident who pays the $4 a day at the MBTA one. I mean, there are already taxpayers right. here. You're right. So, so. That's the flip side. Right. To the court. Yeah. Although this is discretionary. We're all paying taxes. I don't park at the depot. Right, so in a lot of ways, though, you're subsidizing the people who use it when it's only $25. Correct. So the real question so is to put the fee up on those who use it rather than peanut buttering yeah. it everywhere. And, and John, there, there, I think, Bob, to your question, which I, I took as a question, mm -hmm. if, we, if there's an appetite to split, I personally have an appetite to split these two things. Okay. Uh, you know, in my opinion, a $25 compost sticker is a bargain. You know, I mean, and, and it... And as it coincidentally turns out, a $25 sticker, if we for compost, kind of covers the cost, or yep. pretty close, give or take. You're going to sell probably a few less stickers, okay? Right. Um, and you know that, based on the numbers you gave us earlier, um, it kind of is a wash, which is what it should be, because when you think about residential protection and even commercial protection for that matter, on their real estate tax. We take their money and we're spending it on maintaining the compost. And we're spending it on, you know, maintaining the parking lot and the snow removal. So I think the same thing, you, you've given us a pretty good approximation of what it costs to run the compost. My suspicion is we probably find a pretty big number yeah. um, trying to maintain all, all those logs. just snow removal. Yeah. You know, besides the fact that you've got road work to be done, you've yeah. got repair and maintenance that's going to go on. Is that I mean, capital or just operating? Well, you're not supposed to charge capital, but if it's every year paving, that's an operating cost. If it's a capital project, no. You so you don't, down the compost, you don't have anything that's of that nature, where you've got to do something major, like every year or every other No year. comment. Yeah. You should. I think that you not. come on, it seems to me you ought to right. be able to do, it's not going to be a yeah. precise number. Yeah, and to the... To it's going to be an average winter, for example, you know. This is actually re um, expense recovery at the end of the Yes. Day, which we're calling it fees. We're already spending the money in the expense side. We're yeah. freeing money up. Spend. Yeah, currently we are spending taxpayer dollars right. for these expenses. If we, so when a fee comes in that is really an expense reimbursement, what we've done is freed those tax dollars to go back and do something to else. things like public safety and Correct. schools and so forth. And, and that's, why that, you treat that makes, as, that's why it makes sense to me. I'd like to treat this as expense recovery and focus on what the real cost is to deliver and use that to help explain it. Bob? Uh, and just to be clear, uh, sort of to an earlier discussion, um, these, these revenues all go into the general fund. So even though they may cover DPW costs, DPW is not going to get the funding. Right. Two thirds approximately going to the schools, one third approximately going yep. to the town. You know, just to point that it's out. It's like school parking. And, you know, in terms of sort of unintended consequences, which is always what I worry about, I figure that's my job. Um, you don't want to drop the compost center too low and start charging for leaf pickup because then it will dry down there and the neighbors will go out of their mind right. uh, down there. So, the opposite you know, I, I did hear of a recent public hearing um, where the uh, Meadowbrook was in. And that's why I wrote the memo, is just to clarify exactly what the compost center traffic issue is. And it is lower than it was in prior years because, I think, we added leaf pickup. We don't have a, uh, uh, a sticker for commercial use. In other words, if you're a no, ready contractor, do we want to think about that? Because again, no. we, want to, we want to encourage the composting to happen. And if, you know, if you're a Reading contractor and you're going down there and disposing, and you know, obviously that fee would be You mean a landscaper? Yeah. Uh, Aren't those yeah. guys buyers as well as sellers? Aren't they deposits? Those guys, are those guys don't can't come in to the composting area with their commercial vehicles. Correct. They go. There's a place in Woburn. They all go. But they do pick up. Right? They'll, they'll buy material from us. So you probably want to more encourage them. To I, buy. I can ask DPW what their thoughts are on that. I, I've asked them in the past. And again, it's going to come down to monitor. You know, you with, all, with all due respect, you have a senior tax worker out there. What happens when the 
commercial guy comes in and he doesn't have a sticker. Right now they know they can't come in, so they don't. Right. Yeah. Enforcement is a big <coughs> part of this. Right. If you come in with four barrels, okay. You know, you yeah. come in with a, your little utility trailer at four barrels, that's fine. You show up with the big red, right. you know, Joe's landscaping. With the leaf blower. You're not getting in there. Um, yeah, so I, 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 don't, okay. I don't see why philosophically we'd be opposed other than it's just a different type of operation. One, um, one helpful way to look at this, Bob, you had done this earlier. There are two peaks in the demand side of this, one at the, in December and another one is at the end of the year, uh, June, July. Spring. Um, spring. spring time. April, spring. April, May. It's pretty clear those are two different audiences. And while you think of the 25 as getting you two, you know, the parking and the compost, it's pretty clear there's two different buyers out there. And so the compost folks, I, I, I would simplify it and say they're probably buying it for the compost because if they bought it for parking, they would have bought it already. So well, they're okay spending the 25. Being a compost aficionado, I can tell you the following <laughs> thing happens. You know, if I go down and buy my sticker, which yeah. I'll probably buy in February or March when I look out there and go, the place is a mess, I gotta start you know, thinking about it because the snow is gone. I buy the second sticker for 10 bucks. Why? Because I might decide to go on the train. That car yeah. mm -hmm. never goes to the compost. It, right. You know, it's right. the one that I would probably leave at the train right. the way Barry uses it a couple times a month, or I don't use even that often. So yeah, you're gonna there'll be some fall off here or there for that, but you know the compost buyers I think are in the first they're in the first quarter, and the parking are, buyers are in the fourth quarter. Right yeah, they're okay right. with the parking. three prior year. compost buyers in April, May, June are I think by definition <coughs> buying with twenty five bucks to go to the compost center. Yep. The More parkers not, yeah. in January are okay with twenty five bucks to park. They're two different constituencies. It's not. It, and we yep. can view them as two. Right. If you, and if you use the if you use the train every day, you're buying your sticker early because you don't want to get a ticket two yeah. or three times. And then, yeah, it really yeah. Yeah, changes the okay. the economics I'm sorry, dramatically. Man. Vanessa, okay. um, I have two perspectives on this. Um, one wearing my finance committee hat. Um, I would be very interested in the numbers for what it realistically costs or estimated cost for annual maintenance. Um, because I feel that would be really indicative of the expenses to the town. Um, as a resident, though, and I'm, I'm sure this will be discussed more in the future meeting, um, but I would <coughs> hesitate in uh, setting precedent for determining what is optional for some people um, as opposed to something that's a need. I think many people um, are pull to running because of our great location for highways as well as the Reading Depot. So if the parking ticket becomes fair game, then what perceived optional service that the town offers could next be eligible for increased fees. Uh, so I, that would only be my comment to the board. Um, because perhaps this board thinks that's an optional fee, but perhaps next year or however many years down the line, another board thinks that some other service that the town currently covers is now optional, and therefore they're going to increase the fees on that. Okay. Any other comments? Can I comment on that? Sure. As the Redding head, and my brother uses the, um, the Redding parking, and it's always surprising to me that uh, he, the way that he expresses himself is he parks there because it's convenient. And uh, when it comes to the expenses side, doing like snow, it's always more difficult to clean those parking spots that are closer to the paint than are far, further away from the paint. So they might give you an idea to have an approach of dividing sections. And the closer you are to the paint, that parking a sticker might be a little more expensive than the further away you are from it. So that way, you people will pay for convenience. So that, and the other thing is that you're not charging everybody 40 bucks, but someone that wants to park closer to the train and goes there faster is willing so to pay 40 bucks. So it's like the airline model. You the chief will hang himself in enforcement. Maybe we just put those boxes just in the lot. We have to hire four more cops. Because it costs more money to clean those boxes. It's a perfectly reasonable conclusion. I think the laughter is a little bit over the enforcement side. It's almost like you're not in first class, business class, <laughs> economy preferred, an economy, and everyone's got a different color. 
Um, but I, I get the thought. It's, it's market-based pricing. Um, uh, I'll also horrify you with this comment that, <laughs> strictly speaking from an economic development perspective, parking should not be wasted on commuters, downtown parking. That's what we found from our peers. Mm -hmm. no We're parking, in an no unusual customer. situation mm -hmm. where we have a train station, not only a train station, it's in our downtown, really. That is not typical. You think about that's true. where they are. Most other towns. Towns. So that's so that would say you don't you don't devote it entirely to Wakefield. There's the been edge. some discussion internally about you know, and I'm I, I'm horrified at it, but it's like no, that's what people expect. They're not going to want to take a shuttle bus to the train station, but again, strictly from economic development, that's the model. So maybe it's a split model. Anyway, yeah, we've kind of beat this to death. I'm I'm in favor of a of a okay. split approach as well. It's so basically one for the compost and then one for a compost yep. slash parking, right? If you have questions you think of, please send me. I've written down a few here. I will look for them. Cost of service for both, although the compost center is pretty well outlined. And um, you know, what does DPW think about having commercial stickers uh, for the compost center? So is there anything else you think of? No. On that? I guess the only other thing is there any technology or of any sort that's helpful, putting aside for the moment the... Um, well, we've, we've talked about that with respect to downtown parking broadly, yeah. and that's a discussion that will be in front of you at some point in the next six months yeah. or a year. Um, and again, I, I have no opinion on this, but again, from visiting our peer communities, it's much more common that they charge. There's not free downtown parking. Lexington's the best example. Uh, right. I forget the exact cost, but Mass Ave is a certain price, and then as you get away from Mass Ave, it's cheaper. Yeah, to your point, it could be because it's meters. Because it's meters. And but it's the meters. It's the meters are more expensive. They have meters, downtown, but it's Lexington. also. Well, that's kind of the thought. If you had, if you went to per day everywhere, and you had a like, nickel rate, and I'm making this up, a dime yeah. rate, and a dollar rate, you could do what's described here pretty easily if everyone did it electronically. Yeah, I mean, I, personally, I'm horrified at the idea of parking meters all over town visually. Right. Just no. No, I agree. <laughs> We've we got a long way to go. And Economic development side before we can start yeah. thinking about that. Yeah, I agree. All right. gotta, I mean, we have to get commerce in and get it yeah. vibrant. You know, and there's a lot of things stepping in that direction. Yeah. I think that's a dis yeah. this piece of the discussion, I think, is for you know, a future time. Okay. Okay, if there's no other comments, why don't we move our last topic tonight, which is the uh, demand fees review? Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure to have the police at a public meeting. <laughs> um, Good night, Kevin. Good night. This, um, this chart, when I first start, saw it, I had to ask the finance department to do it again because I knew it was wrong, but it wasn't wrong. <laughs> it was right. I was, I was, I'm still shocked what it says. Um, this is the last three years, and what we've collected in demand fees, which again are $25 per tax bill per bill. Um, That's for being late. For being late, for having a late payment, not just from the date, but a certain amount of leniency after the date. Um, we collect five, six thousand dollars <coughs> on real estate tax bills that are late. Uh, we collect a thousand dollars for personal property, and we collect fifty-five thousand for cars for excess tax. Is there a reason cars? And those are separate from like the water thing. Yes. Why are cars more prone? Just more of them. Because people have mortgages and banks pay the mortgage for them and yes. don't pay late. And right. people are actually responsible for their own time. excise tax bills and this is what people tend to do. So on average, 2,000 tax bills a year are paid late, uh, excise tax bills, which just totally seemed unrealistic to me. And I, I think we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 23,000 excise bills. Um, you may not know yet, but I, that also surprised me when I first, like 9,000 <coughs> houses and we have 23,000 cars, and the answer is yes. We have more than two cars registered per household. Per household. So about 10% of people with an excise tax bill are paying late every year. We have the toys, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the motorhome, the boat. You yeah. know, from our observation, it's very similar people year after. And I've fallen into this group once or twice. Once you fall in once, you don't tend to do it again. And uh, after you know listening and, and being upstairs for many years, I agreed to bring this discussion in front of the selectmen. Um, on the one hand, it seems grossly unfair for a $60 excise tax bill to have a $25 penalty. 
and to have a four thousand dollar property tax bill, a thousand quarterly, fifteen hundred quarterly, have the same twenty five dollar penalty. That is state law. Welcome to state law. That is oh, so not something could, Reading can do anything about. You can't do it as a percentage no. of the bill. It's nope. one for everything. One number. Twenty five bucks. One price covers all late bills. One rate to rule. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you have any discretion over whether you that, that's, issue it or not? That's the next topic. So I agreed to bring this discussion because the excise ratio just seems silly. And many people who are late have relatively small excise tax bills. Um, you know, as soon as your car depreciates past five or six years, your excise tax bill is 100 bucks or 200 bucks. So, so it's on 40, 47 50 Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did a survey of our peers as best we could. And 25 is high. There are a couple that are higher, 30. And just so you're, those that don't know on the board, it's been $25 for, a, for quite a while. Um, I'm gonna say eight or nine years, I'm not sure. It was, it was a long time ago that this was run in front of town meeting for whatever the reason. So um, a really important number is $15. If you are above $15 a year for demand fees, this guy has no legal authority to waive it must be collected. I have bent those rules and risked imprisonment just for one type of exception because it always seemed to me that someone who was hospitalized and physically unable to pay the bill should be allowed some leniency. So when I was upstairs I did that a handful of times. But if the person who was hospitalized typically paid, typically paid the bill and the spouse who did not was able to but didn't know how, oh well, that's not a good exception. If the person f literally cannot pay the bill because they're in a hospital, that seemed like a good reason to me. And I was technically violating state law for that, but that was okay. If we lower it, or and the set would have to go to town meeting, if it was reduced to $15, um, then every single person can complain to the treasurer and say, I was in the hospital. I, well, whatever, they, they can have any reason at all. And there's lots of pretty good reasons, you know. So. You know, we have to weigh operationally, it's similar to the last discussion, what's the cost of collection? What's the cost of, you know, keeping your eye on the depot, keeping your eye on the compost center? Um, if everyone can contest a $15 late fee, I would suggest that rationally everyone should. And rationally, uh, we're collecting, you know, $70,000 from this now, uh, put, to put all together, and this again is a partial year, I would say you should assume you're going to lose all or most of that money because what is he going to stand up and what is he going to defend if he has discretion? Uh, I would expect him to be very lenient because generally we are as lenient as possible with people upstairs. Well, the purpose of the demand fee is primarily, the, I presume, the cost of the outstanding interest and a discouragement to do it again. It is. Um, it is very much a discouragement from doing it again, and yet we see it again. Yeah, and we want them to pay the original bill. We do. That's all we want is pay on time. So then if, the, if it's repetitive and it's the same individuals, do you still feel the same way about it being um, un well, oversized? One thing that I, I, I've thought about this for the last couple of weeks especially, um, I'm going to say five or six years ago, we stopped sending out warnings of people when they were late because it was costing us, again, 10 grand or whatever right. the number. We said, you know, we're laying off people, let's cut that out, let's cut this cost. It's not an easy thing to do, but I, I think it'd be a lot more palatable to send out some kind of warning than to just change this entirely. And Create people, more expense. Yeah, to, to cause five or $10,000 of postage and staff time to give uh, people one last chance. On our, on Historically, our, that has not done much. On our um, town census, which we are required to send out, do we ask for email addresses? I don't think so. Oh, I'm not sure if we can. Yeah. Can we ask for email addresses? It'd just I'm be so sure. much easier for him to send out an email as a little yeah. Or have it automated. Well, well we have, yeah. we and, have and, and through it, the website an ability to sign up specifically for payments, for warnings when you're late. And I don't know, last time I looked, it was 500 people signed up. So those That's people do thing. get electronic. Um, we do a better job marketing that. Maybe yeah. a silly thought, but if you, with every demand fee, if you said, look, sign up here and we'll warn you, you, did, you didn't have it earlier, it's an opt-in, we can't do it without your permission, you'll get a warning from us, I don't know, 30 days, 60 days, Yeah. and then you've got a way to kind of drive it. I'd be inclined to want to, 
to warn people and then feel better about this yeah. knowing that you've given the last chance. Okay. Bringing this down has got a bunch of problems. One is the yeah, revenue reduction. Two is you create, if you go low enough, hell for somebody else's life. And as you said, most of it's because we're naturally lenient, much of it's going to be at risk. Yeah, I'd be okay. And, and I, would, I would be fine with causing him aggravation. <laughs> That's part of my job, too. Um, but I can't in good conscience ask November Town Meeting and support a loss of $70,000 of revenue. I might be able to after an override if it succeeds. That's a really tough conversation. I, I know. I, I have a question. I know. People should just pay the bill. I, Absolutely. Going, Barry, you know, it's <laughs> starting to scare me. You and I are on one page so much lately. It's really <laughs> making me wonder about things. It's beautiful. I mean, it's honestly, beautiful. why should the people that pay their bills Subsidize. have to have subsidized and they're, they would they are right. subsidizing somebody who decides that they can you know that they can run off the rails and get away with it it's I not okay totally agree with you pay your bills yeah. I, and honestly and pay and your bills and, and if you're late that there's are, a fee it's a stated fee yeah. you'll get charged now obviously if someone's in the hospital someone i mean you know you know, yeah. we'll do the right there, thing. I mean, you use certain discretion in certain Only extreme one. cases. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Look, at, um, it's not about being a hard guy. It's just, no. look, I mean, it, we are in a society where, you know, bills, bills come due and they need to be paid well, because everybody's depending on it. I'll get to that because that's an important point. We're also in a society where consumers are usually in charge. And when they deal with their bank and have this issue, the banks, oh, I'm terribly sorry. We'll waive that fee all the time. <clears throat> Right. Retail wave fees less and less I often. Will, I will tell you, really? yes. as a banker, who have requests almost every day to waive fees. Yeah. Here's my policy. <coughs> First one, okay, all right. Maybe you didn't know you needed to keep a certain amount. Yeah. This is your mulligan. Second one, <coughs> don't bother. Yeah. I think that you know we're in a bit of a bind here, as you pointed out in the beginning, that um, being government, we're we're it's one rule across the board. So I wouldn't want to lower it below $25 for for the um, real estate uh, yeah. tax because that seems kind of in line. Um, so we're sort of stuck with the excise number. Yeah, and, and to respond to uh, John's comment, which is an important one, uh, the reason there are late fees and the reason there are <coughs> interest and penalties is because municipalities and businesses need cash flow to run themselves. Um, we are generally in very financially good shape in that regard, but we're unusual in that regard that we have good cash balances. That's not to say we will always have good, good cash customers. balances. I don't know. But if, if uh, you know, a large segment of your customers stop paying on time, <coughs> you run into a real serious problem. So absolutely, the answer is pay your bills on time. I, I couldn't agree with that more. I guess the only ask out of here is, is there a way to notify people about a pending obligation? Yeah, automated we can do that, and it would be nice to automate it electronically. I, mean, I, I just really think you cannot, based on what I'm seeing there, the, the large majority of the people that have excise tax bills that come due, pay them. Pay them in a timely way. That's what that tells me. Based on how many thousands of yeah, cars? ninety some percent pay. Of time. course. Right. So, uh, honestly, you cannot manage. You can't. This is a business. You can't manage the business to the lowest common denominator. Right. And because I, what you will have is a shoddy business. Right. If you subsidize something, you get more of it. And if we change this, you'll get yeah. more of it. Okay. Um, and I think ninety percent is not a bad number. Things are fine. There's not a problem here to, to solve, other than maybe notifying people. Uh, with that, I think we've come to the end of the evening. Uh, is there any other business to come before the board? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Seconded. All those in favor? Now it's 5-0. <laughs>